this I'm okay calling to order the city of boulder planning board meeting of september 20th 2022 um, and uh, i see that we have one two three four five we have a quorum tonight uh, so uh welcome back to mark um and we'll move right into our public participation item tonight that is uh, we don't have any minutes to discuss tonight, so uh, this is the time when you can address the uh, planning board on any issue uh, that you wish, because we have no planning, we have no hearing going on tonight. So, uh, so everything is on limits, and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. Brenda, would you like to administer the, I the meeting? I sure will, and I'm seeing only one community member in attendance tonight, and I do know that Ms. Siegel is well familiar with our meeting rules, so I'm going to go ahead and skip those if you don't mind, John. That's fine with me. Great. Okay, so Vivian, if you can share the timer. Yeah, let's try this. Okay. And I think you need your camera on, but then put your thumb over your physical camera, if that makes sense. And thank you all for your patience while we do a first first try at this timer background for our brand new um, planning engagement strategist, Vivian Castro Woldridge. So I don't need to Yeah, not seeing it. Okay, that is okay. Um, so then I'm going to use my cell phone, which will be weird. I know you've been patient with that before, and I appreciate you being patient with it again tonight. And I know also that it's probably preferred to um, losing everyone's faces. So, um, and welcome to our other community member who just joined us. We are just now going into open comment. So if you would like to speak tonight, um, we encourage you to raise your hand. Just realizing Ms. Siegel, I have taken for granted that you would like to speak, but your hand is not up. So um, I'm going to ask again for anyone who would like to speak to use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and let us know that you would like to speak tonight. Because I don't want to put you on the spot if that was not your intention. And I am not yet seeing hands go up. Yep, uh, okay, good. We have one hand up. Lynn, I'm going to unmute, um, enable your microphone, you should be able to unmute now, and we'll see if how this works. All right. Can you see it? No, you can't. Awesome. Let's try again. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Super fun one at a... Isn't this an interesting game <laughs> that, that, like, I just wonder who's the other person at the meeting? Oh my gosh, I can't know. If I were live down there, then I guess I could, but maybe it's a big snowstorm and maybe I'm 69 and maybe I'm not vaccinated. Maybe I don't want to come down there and maybe I've got another meeting back to back. So what is this? You, how does that make you feel that you can see who's at your meeting, but I can't? How does that make you feel, folks? Don't think about city council. Don't think about Teresa. She's not God. She's just an attorney. Is that right? You know, but I don't. I don't get to know. What's that about? What is that about? Last night, I was at the RAB meeting. And I brought up a lot about, before I knew what was on the agenda, actually, water use, planning, long-term planning, comprehensive planning, intersectional, you know, like interdependent type, large-scale planning. Um, that includes quantification of water use for expanding population and the responsibility of the RAB to advise city council on CU South. 
which will be the largest expansion of population in this area in decades and decades. To me, it's fascinating that, you know, I mean, Gordon Curry came back and said, well, we can't, we, you know, what we do is we advise about the CIP and the drought and the master plan. You know, guess what? I haven't read those docs, but you know what? The master plan, the drought plan, the CIP, all the money you spend, everything, everything is about water, isn't it? Water's life. We don't have any, we don't have anything. And if we're planning, you know, building up and up and out and out and not making any recommendations or giving any advice to the city council on CU, that's a problem, a huge problem. Building on a floodplain, breaking up the, the alluvium, changing the down, you know, our liability, the downhill people of, of all of that flow. The FEMA maps, you know, the FEMA doesn't know what they're doing either. So what do we know about what we're doing? And how are we gonna make it better? Quantify the water use and know what CU is gonna build before any agreement is made. Thank you. And if anyone else is interested in offering public comment tonight, now is the time to raise your hand. And I see no other hands that have gone up, John. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, uh, we will move right into our uh, discussion of dispositions and call-ups and continuations. And tonight uh, we have just one issue, uh, call-up of, uh, of the uh, Shining Mountain project, which I think all of us are familiar with. Um, I think there's something special we should recognize tonight. And that is that this may be our last chance to uh, harass Elaine on uh, any issue which we want to uh, do because rumor has it that she'll be leaving the city soon and that this is the last uh, project that we get to uh, look into with her. So keep that in mind and uh, look forward to uh, learning if anyone wants to call this up or has any questions. Mr. Chair, I will reconscript her though. If there's a public hearing, we need to bring her back for, I can't go in alone. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody? Well, I wasn't going to call it up, but since you brought it up, and since it, I, maybe we will just to just to keep Elaine around just one more a little bit longer. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So. <laughs> okay. So, well, Elaine, congratulations and uh, good luck. Thank you and for that. Thanks, thanks, Thank you. thanks for, for all you've done with us. Thank you. And um, I appreciate all of you as well um, and your professionalism. Um, I'll miss now Tuesday nights, um, not joining you, but um, best of luck on everything. And it's been an honor to serve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine, so much. You know, we always say thank you for your service to our military, and there's very good reason for that. But I think there is also good reason to say thank you for your service to our public servants, because you go through heaven and hell to try to make this city a better place. And we so appreciate you, Elaine, and, and all of your years helping out the city of Boulder. We are a better place because of you. So thank you so much. Okay. ML, did you, were you raising your hand or? Oh, no, you're muted. 
Um, I wasn't raising, I was having a thumb up. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I haven't really had the opportunity to work with Elaine much in my little short tenure on this board, but I must say every time a project comes up that has your name on it, Elaine, I expect nothing but top notch planning input and that's, you, you do that and I appreciate that. So thank you very much and I hope wherever you're going that the, they welcome you with big arms. <laughs> Thanks, ML. Okay. It's an official retirement. So, no, oh, even better. <laughs> You're welcome in yourself. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't see any uh, any indication that there's a call up here. So, congratulations and thank you once again. And it looks like we won't be calling this up. Oh, Mark, you have your hand up. Not. To, don't worry. It's not to call this up but it is to ask a question in regard to this sort of thing. When I, uh, when I look at items that we have the ability to call up, um, many of them are of import and some are not. And then some fall into this category of, well, what would happen if we actually called something like this item up at this late date and the final plat. It seems a very um, perfunctory sort of thing that, that there's nothing we could do after having planning board, council, et cetera, um, go through all these stages. So I, 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 my question is, uh, is, is there a, uh, an example of calling something up upon final plat approval or in, in this stage that would make sense or has, has happened historically and actually changed something. Um, is, is there an example of that? And, uh, or is it, is it just, we just never call this stuff up at this point because it would be pointless. You know, it's a great question, Mark. I don't know that I have any great examples of a final plat being called up this late in a in a site review process or um, as part of a site review process. Oftentimes, final plats on a project such as this are an actual requirement of the site review um, approval. So when the site review was approved, there was a lit, you know a litany of approval of uh, conditions. This was the final subdivision document being one of them. So in many ways, this just executes the approval that the board has already made. Um, if the board were to call it up, um, we wouldn't be able to issue building permits for the site review. They wouldn't be able to execute um, the entitlement that they've been granted from the board until you guys had the hearing on the subdivision and examined uh, staff's analysis of the criteria. So uh, which... Um, when it comes to subdivision are very prescriptive. They're pretty black and white. Either you meet the minimum lot standards or you don't. Either you meet the access requirements or you don't. Um, so I don't know that I have any great examples to cite, but um, in this case, it, it simply implements an approval that's already been issued. Great, thank you very much. You bet. Laura. Oh, I was just going to note that Amanda was back, but I see she's been promoted. So, so welcome back, Amanda. And um, I don't want to preempt if anybody else has comments about Mark's question or anything, but I just wanted to say congratulations to the Waldorf School and the project team and city staff who worked on this um, as a whole. Uh, it, it looks like a great project, and I'm excited to see it moving forward. Okay. Well, thank you, Elaine. It looks like you're off the hook. Okay, so uh, now we move into a, a discussion and this, into the section of the meeting called Matters from the Planning Board, Planning Director, and City Attorney. And the first thing on our agenda is a presentation of the use table and standards uh, with a, an update of the project and a module two introduction. And Charles, I'm not, you, you might want to introduce this. I'd be happy to just want to introduce uh, Lisa Hood, our staff senior planner, and she'll be presenting staff's analysis this evening. I believe Carl Geiler, our other superstar code amendment 
planner is also uh, on the call tonight if there's additional questions, but Lisa, feel free to take it away. Thanks, Charles. Good evening, members of the planning board. I'm looking forward to this conversation about the use table and standards project. Uh, the purpose of bringing this to you tonight as a matters item is to update you on the second phase of the project and discuss the next steps related to industrial areas and the neighborhood serving uses. So as you'll remember, you've seen this a few times this year, the phase two of the use table and standards project is split into three different modules. So we had our first module, the functional fixes were those technical updates that you saw this spring and they were up adopted in June. And now we're really working on module two, which is focused on industrial areas, hoping to get that done by the end of this year. And then we'll move into module three, which is related to neighborhoods, neighborhood areas, neighborhood centers, things like that. I'm going to do a little bit of background just to remind you. Um, this project has been in going on since 2018 when it was identified as a priority project by planning board. Um, we adopted phase one of the project back in 2019 and started phase two in 2020, did some virtual engagement at that point, uh, but we had to put it on pause in the fall of 2020 and we picked it back up at the beginning of this year. So we're back in the swing of things with this use table project. Um, but we are still using all of the great public engagement to guide uh, the rest of this project from what was done before that pause. Uh, the initial goals for the project are also still in place. So those are really based on trying to update, uh, simplify and streamline the use table to make it more understandable and legible. That was really the focus of module one. Um, and just generally creating more predictability and certainty in what's a very complex part of our code or hopefully is much improved from module one now. Um, but the remainder of work in module two and module three is really focused on those third and fourth goals. So that's aligning the use table and the permitted uses with the Boulder Valley comp plan, making sure that, that we're allowing things that we're saying that we want in the comp plan, also allowing that in the code. And then also identifying where there might be some gaps where the community wants certain uses, but the use table might be acting as a barrier to those. So that's really the focus for both the industrial areas and the neighborhood areas. You might remember that we had a planning board subcommittee that was providing a ton of great guidance before the project was paused, over 20 meetings where they really dug in row by row, column by column uh, into the use table and have provided really great um, guidance that's still leading the project. So areas of consideration, things to think about, changes to make um, really at a fine grained level. We've kind of re-envisioned that planning board subcommittee since the project has been restarted and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, as a group, the whole planning board has seen this item several times, a couple times this year, but also back in 2018, 19, and 20. Um, but you all are probably familiar, most familiar with this second phase of the project that we've been talking about this year. So I wanted to focus, you probably saw in the memo that we kind of have three main questions that we wanted to ask you tonight to get some direction as we um, really start to actually draft the ordinance language for module two. And so the first two questions are focused on that module two, the industrial districts. And then the third question is more just general direction for the module three related to neighborhoods. So we haven't quite started that part yet. So it's more just, you know, here's the direction that we've heard so far before the project was paused and from the public engagement. Um, is there anything else we should think about integrating uh, before we get started? So Digging in first to industrial districts, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on the districts and the policies that are guiding this. So you all are probably familiar, there are basically three areas in Boulder that have industrial zoning. And that's really the focus for module two is these areas that have industrial districts uh, within them. So we've been talking a lot lately about East Boulder. That's where there's a big chunk of industrial zoning. There's also quite a significant land area of industrial zoning up in Gun Barrel. And then we have a small area of industrial zoning at the very north end of the city on North Broadway. So those are the three areas that we're focusing on for module two. Um, if you have memorized every single one of our 40 plus zoning districts, you'll already know this, but just a refresher for some, we have four industrial zoning districts. Our first is the IS, that's the industrial service district. 
And that's really the intent in the code says that that should be for repair and service uses for the community um, and small scale manufacturing uses. Oh, Sarah, I see your hand. So I just have a question. Can you give us any sense of how much of our industrial space we've lost since like the mid 1990s? Um, I don't have that number offhand, but I'm sure it's something that we could look up and get back to you. Um, yeah, so IS um, is the industrial service. So repair and service uses, small scale manufacturing. That's really the intent of those districts. There's the IS1 and IS2. So we have two of those. Um, there's also the industrial general or IG. That's kind of the light industrial district. That's where in light industrial uses, research, manufacturing, also service industrial is supposed to be there. And the, the land use code actually says that residential and complementary uses are appropriate in some locations of the IG um, areas. IM is somewhat similar, um, but kind of generally larger lots. There's research developing, development, uh, manufacturing, service industrial, and same thing about residential and complementary uses being um, possible in uh, appropriate locations. IMS is a kind of a different animal. It's more meant to be a transition between industrial areas and commercial areas. So um, it's much more pedestrian oriented, kind of focuses on the industrial uses being at the first floor and maybe there's industrial, residential or office above. So those are the four districts that we're talking about and focusing on tonight. Just some reminder of the policy background. So I mentioned that those initial goals for this project are to implement the comprehensive plan. So for this module, this really focuses on this, po this policy from the comp plan 2.21. So this is screenshotted from the code. Um, and we've really been focusing on these guiding principles that are in the comp plan. Um, really one, two, and three are related to land use changes. Four and five are more transportation related. But that's what we're using to guide the work. So First guiding principle is to preserve established businesses and the opportunity for industrial businesses, but also balance that with also encouraging housing infill in appropriate places. And also offering a mix of uses in these areas as well. So those are kind of the three guiding principles that we're thinking about and trying to implement through these changes. Before we get into the questions, the specific questions, I did want to highlight our public engagement work for this project. Um, for the remainder of 2022 and then into 2023 as we get to module three, um, I mentioned we've kind of re-envisioned that planning board subcommittee. Um, it was a fairly formal process where the planning board could talk, but the public couldn't really engage. Um, they could provide comments, but it wasn't um, a direct way to really have a conversation. And so we've re-envisioned that as we have our planning board liaisons, which are Sarah and ML, who we've been working with about every other month, um, kind of diving further into detail on these projects and getting some initial guidance and thoughts and just thinking through some of these issues um, with them, which is awesome. We went on a tour of all the industrial districts back in August, just kind of thinking through some of these topics and seeing what's out there. Uh, but we also have a use table and standards public working group. So that's about 20 folks who interested residents, um, people that either represent the arts community or business community, um, really just trying to bring through, bring together a diverse group of voices to provide both um, guidance from the outset of each of these modules and also feedback once we have drafts. So we're meeting with them. Um, every other month as well, trying to work through this project with them so that we have this early and often engagement with that group as well. But in addition to these kind of focused conversations that we're having with these two groups, we also want to do broader um, engagement to the uh, broad public of the city. So we did have a questionnaire available um, over the last few weeks on Be Heard Boulder, the public engagement site. So I'll go over some of the results that we got from that questionnaire, which I think will help frame the discussion. And now that the COVID situation is somewhat improving, I never want to say that because it's going to jinx it, but um, we're hoping to integrate some more in-person opportunities as well as virtual in the future. So I mentioned this questionnaire. It was open. Um, it actually is still open for comments, but um, I did a snapshot in time of what we had heard as of yesterday morning. So these are responses from August 30th through September 18th. We've actually gotten a few more since then, um, but we've got 83 responses, which is great for a, a very technical zoning topic. Um, 
And we promoted the questionnaire through our planning and development services newsletter, which reaches over 5,000 recipients. Uh, our communications team did a post on Nextdoor to all Boulder residents and about 3,000 people uh, viewed that post. Our Facebook and Twitter accounts had posted um, promotions about those both on September 1st and 14th. We have tons of followers on social media. Um, and then we also did some direct outreach to over 80 businesses that are located in the industrial zoning district. So making sure that those voices um, knew that the questionnaire was out there and that they were able to participate that way. So let's get to some of these results. It was a simple questionnaire. Um, we did actually uh, vet some of these questions with our public working group. So making sure that we used um, terminology and kind of the questions that we wanted to hear. So that's been a helpful addition from that working group as well. Uh, just some guidance on um, the public engagement. But first question, how important is it to you to retain space for industrial uses? Um, this one might be a little skewed because probably the people that are interested in it are likely to take that survey. Um, but it was about three quarters of people that said it was important or extremely important to retain space in industrial districts. So validating that this is an important topic and this is really why it is a main focus of this use table and standards project. The second question is related to housing. So we asked if people agreed with the statement, housing should be allowed in industrial areas. You'll see that this one is much more mixed. So about a little over half of people said that they agreed or strongly agreed, um, but we had over 30% of people say strongly disagree or disagree. So definitely mixed uh, reactions to that. There was a lot more um, detail added to the next question because there was an open comment option. Um, so this was kind of a related question that if housing is allowed, how should the city determine which sites are appropriate for housing? And we gave some options like close to supporting uses like retail and restaurants, close to transit on a case by case basis, using contiguity, which is our existing standard, using our sub community plans or a location on major street. We also gave this other ideas and that's where people really added a lot more information about where they thought that might be appropriate and it was usually um, I mean, it was a wide variety of comments, but kind of adding more nuance to, well, if housing was allowed, it should not be in this location or should be in this location or should be this height or there's a lot more specifics in that. And um, because we did just close the survey, I didn't have the um, full summary for you, but the full summary of all of the engagement and um, or all of the results and the written comments will be available on the Be Heard Boulder site soon, and it will definitely be available by the next time that you see this project. So just wanted to give the high level for now. Um, but this is an interesting result because um, these are uh, good ways to think about what, how we could, might change um, how we determine where sites are appropriate for housing in the residential areas. And um, one thing is in the working group, there was a lot of discussion about the adopted subcommunity plans being a good way to identify those locations. And I think that um, several of these kind of speak to subcommunity plans. So a subcommunity plan would tell you, you know, where you're close to other supporting uses or close to transit or things like that. So they kind of all work together um, in my mind. Okay, this next one, um, it might look a little complicated for data, but what we did with the question is we gave 25 different examples of different types of businesses and asked people to answer what types of businesses do you think are appropriate in industrial areas. And so they could choose as many as they wanted, um, or all of them. And I think it's interesting to look at this data kind of from two perspectives. There's the bars, which is the number of people that voted for each use. But then if you also think about the percentage of respondents, I think that's interesting too. Um, so that's the, the bar at the top. So over 75% of people that took this questionnaire said that these uh, businesses in that green box um, were appropriate in industrial areas. So number one was research and development, warehouses, cabinetry, manufacturing, biotech, um, artist workshops. Those were kind of the top um, that over three quarters of people said were appropriate, but there's a lot of businesses in that kind of 50 to 75% range. So over half of people also said that those were appropriate. Um, so that's things like restaurants, coffee shops, um, engineering firms, architect offices, uh, retail. 
And then in that gray box on the right side, those are people kind of around 50%, between 39 and 50% of people said that those were appropriate. So those are a little bit lower than the others. Um, that's school, realtor office, hair salon, kind of more personal service type uses um, in that category. So this is kind of an interesting way just to get at um, what people perceive as being appropriate in an industrial area. Hi, ML. I see your hand. Hi, Lisa. Um, so these um, percentages, are these the uses that were voted the number one use by those amount of those percentages of people? Yeah, well, they could, or they is could, it like, could, could have been a second or third? It could have been, they could have chosen all 25. So one vote, right. so it's one vote per person on each one. So that means like for research and development, we had 83 people take the, the questionnaire, 67 of them said that research and development was appropriate, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, but they not, it's not their first choice. No, it's not a it's not a ranking. It was just a choice. Like they, some people chose two businesses. Some people chose twenty five. Yeah. And they could have chosen them all. Like one person yeah. could have said they're all appropriate. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not a weighted um, in, you know, 50, seventy greater than seventy five percent of the people think that those top that first box that those are the uses. Those same right. people could have voted for any of the others as well. Yeah, it's not necessarily that those are the ones they think are um, most appropriate. It's that the most people said that that was appropriate. So that's why I was, thought it was interesting to look at the percentage because that was, right. you know, over three quarters of people thought that this business was appropriate in some level in the industrial areas. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Um, so we also had an open, that was kind of the end of the multi, multiple choice, but we had an open-ended um, section, which um, we got a lot of great feedback in there, kind of a wide range of topics, but definitely a focus on the residential, um, either for or against residential and industrial. So that's definitely um, the topic most probably on people's minds. There are also just some general comments um, in support of mixed of uses in industrial areas in support of schools um, related to some related to building height, offices, redevelopment from some of the industrial businesses, some concern about re redevelopment, maybe pushing out those industrial businesses. Um, so a lot of great comments there. I'm sorry, I don't have those for you tonight, but I will have those uh, very soon um, once we actually close the survey officially or the questionnaire officially and then um, post those results. So just wanted to give you an idea of what we were hearing from that before we start a conversation. Um, I also wanted to um, let you know just some of the feedback we've been getting from city council. Um, we did take this item almost an identical presentation to city council a couple of weeks ago for a study session to get some guidance from them. Um, we had also taken this back in 2020, so I kind of mixed those together. Um, but what we've heard from council is a support for additional uses like residential retail and restaurants in light industrial areas, and that's really to foster those mixed use neighborhoods. Um, but also expressing a need to balance the protection of existing industrial with introducing new residential. So really that, that big question of industrial and residential. And then with the questions that we posed for them this year, a couple weeks ago, they're the same questions that were in your memo tonight. Um, so very specific, a little more targeted questions. Uh, unanimous support from city council to update the standards for residential development in industrial districts, eliminate the contiguity requirement that's currently uh, um, sets the eligibility, and instead to assess the suitability of sites based on subcommunity plans and the comp plan guidance. Uh, they also said it wasn't appropriate. They didn't think it was appropriate that all industrial areas or sites, um, kind of the theme of the conversation was guardrails. They'd like to see guardrails to protect the industrial uses, and then especially in the IS zones, which was the industrial service zones. And so that was related to residential. The question related to offices. Council was in support of combining our professional office and technical office terms. I'll get into that a little bit later when we get to that question. Um, but similarly with guardrails, um, they said that restriction on offices were still needed to avoid displacing industrial uses and accelerating speculative office development. Yes, Sarah. 
can you you skipped over the business feedback that you got on the be heard boulder you gave us the sort of generalities but of, of everyone's response but you specifically mentioned that you reached out to something like 80 businesses and i'm curious specifically <laughs> what were their what were their concerns or <laughs> what did they say yeah so um kind of in that open comment section I, there wasn't a question that specifically assigned each response to a business owner so i could mostly just tell by like when we promoted it and then got responses and whether they were talking about businesses um but the the responses that related to industrial businesses a few of them were concerned that they would lose their space or that they would were getting were having to find other space in other communities because they couldn't find anywhere that had like the right ceiling heights for their use um, so those were some of those are the two that I can think of that really stood out related to industrial businesses. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right, so I think that's um, all the engagement summary that I wanted to give to you. And now we can dig into each one of these questions. I was thinking that we would pause kind of after each question and have that discussion if you're amenable to that chair. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we'll dive in with the most complicated and hard question first, the residential development in industrial districts. So I'm going to start. Yeah, Laura. I'm sorry, before we move on, um, I think the engagement summary was it was really useful. I wanted to ask, have you done the math? <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you done the math of 83 respondents? What percentage is that of Boulder's population? I haven't done the math. I'm not good enough in math to do that. Um, I mean, it's it's a questionnaire, not a scientific survey, and so obviously we're reaching out as much as we can, promoting it to through through social media and the avenues that we do have. Um, and 83 responses is more than we've gotten for any response on use tables. So. Um, I, oh, I absolutely yeah. agree. I think I think you're doing a bang up job of trying to reach out to people and get um, get people who care about this to comment. And I'm surprised anybody comments on the use tables, frankly. But um, I think if please check my math, but if we have about 100,000 people in Boulder, just round number, um, 83 respondents is less than one tenth of 1%. So I think we just need to keep that in perspective that the Be Heard Boulder, I'm going to make this comment every time we talk about Be Heard Boulder, it's always going to be the very small, most passionate squeaky wheel sample. Right. I said yeah, that I about the East Boulder subcommunity plan as well, and they did just an amazing, you know, over three years trying to reach out to people, but that's just the way it's always going to be with a, a survey like this. Right. Yeah, that's, it's a, it's a point of feedback and something to consider, but obviously not a scientific um, survey of the whole community. Thank you. Thanks. Sarah. Sarah. So um, I want to follow up on what Laura was saying. Um, we hardly ever get scientific um, surveys for these big ideas that the city is kicking around, which is, I think, a, a problem. Um, but I would also point out that um, now, now my, my thought has gone out of my head. I'm still having some COVID fog brain, so my apologies. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, I know. So it raises a question of the level of public engagement that has been designated for this project, which is consultation. And as defined in the packet you gave us, consultation is, you say this more politely, but it's essentially, we will listen and nod and and hear what you have to say, <laughs> then we will move forward and just do what we're going to do. Um, and I'm a little concerned about that uh, because, and this is why my initial question was how much industrial land have we already lost in the last 25, 30 years? Because it's been a lot. It's a lot. I mean, all of uh, Transit Village used to be industrial. Um, a lot of industrial space over in East Boulder will be lost to residential. So it's a little hard. I think these are these may be technical changes, but they have very significant ramifications for the city, um, good and bad, or potentially good, potentially bad. And um, I, I do feel pretty strongly that we might wanna reconsider the public engagement level that we, um, 
utilize for this project so that a year from now, um, the general public isn't, you know, showing up with pitchforks at city council because all of a sudden, unknown, unbeknownst to them, <clears throat> someone's proposing putting a little shopping area at the intersection of their streets. So I, I would just like to suggest that we reconsider <clears throat> the level of public engagement. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. And we we haven't finalized the plans for module three. And actually, I met with our engagement staff today to talk about that. So um, we're still working towards that. And we know that that's going to be kind of the biggest lift in terms of public engagement that impacts to neighborhoods. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at the consult um, framework and what we can do to supplement that. We did do two years of engagement um, before we paused. So I do, I just want to emphasize that that was not lost. That engagement work wasn't lost. Um, no, it wasn't lost, but I was part of that. And it was the, it was to Laura's point, it was like the same 12 people. I mean, I, we, I could name them all, <laughs> which is great to have 12 people who care that much. But, you know, per our conversation a couple weeks ago or our email exchange, there were no no businesses that were operating in industrial zones. Like there, none of the folks who are actually directly impacted by this were among the 12 or so who participated in those meetings uh, in the first round. So I just am a little concerned um, and I have no dog in this hunt, but I am a little concerned that there's some voices that are being left outside the conversation that we really need to work very hard to bring them in before we pass any ordinances or make any big decisions. Yeah, I think that's a great point and we'll, we'll definitely focus on that. If, if I can uh, uh, add a little bit uh, at this point, I, I have uh, two suggestions uh, that I think would be useful here. One is to make sure that uh, that we are placing the information provided to the public in in a suitable context, and that, for example, what what Sarah raised earlier, asking about how much industrial land has been converted or has has been lost, so to speak, uh, I, th I think that's a, a very interesting uh, item of information that that might affect people's response uh, to, to the other questions that you're asking. Um, and the other suggestion would be to contact uh, firms and uh, manufacturing outfits that have moved out of town to see why they did, uh, whether, and, and I think you've uh, alluded to this, you know, whether they needed a higher ceiling or couldn't find affordable space or or what but i've never seen a, a coherent uh, analysis of that and i think it's uh, very relevant here yeah that's great feedback um we will do that those are great ideas thank you if i could just add to that um i think we have had some conversations with our community vitality staff and i believe that they have also reached out to folks or firms that have left the city to understand the reasons why they left so we could also follow up with them. Um, and I also just wanted to add that, you know, as we've gone through this project, you know, we've been kind of at a, at a higher level getting input. And as we get closer to like the more technical details, it, it helps to know exactly what changes we'll be working on because then that speaks to who we need to, to reach out to. And that's what we're going to have to do after we get feedback from the board tonight. Okay. Oh, I see Laura has some something to offer here. Um, so one other thing, as long as we're talking about uh, interesting questions that we might want to research, I think it would be really interesting to ask people, what services do you need or have you needed while you've lived in Boulder that you could not find in Boulder? Like, what do people have to go out of town for? Yeah, that's a great one. Any other questions or should we dig into residential? I'm sure people will pop up with their wisdom at the at some point here too, so carry on. All right, great. Okay, so the first question to tackle is related to residential development. I just wanted to provide some kind of policy background 
history of um, where we are now. So it kind of dates back to 1997. We, the city underwent a comprehensive rezoning study to really address the jobs and housing balance. Um, and at that time, there was no residential allowed in industrial. It was really focused on protecting the industrial districts from residential uses. Um, but only seven years later, in 2004, the residential development and industrial district standards were adopted, and residential standards were made allowed in the industrial districts or in IG and IM um, with a use review. So you all are familiar, use review is the discretionary process um, to review uses and uh, use and its compatibility um, and appropriateness. Sorry, I'm having a screen issue. <laughs> um, so on your right-hand side, however, um, they, the, this use review is only applicable to certain sites. So not every site in IG and IM are eligible for residential development. So you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, a map that shows which parcels in the IG and IM zoning districts are eligible for residential use based on those standards that were adopted in 2004. So the pink parcels are not eligible for residential use. Um, the light blue are eligible for residential use. And the dark blue are either approved, have an approved project or approved residential project or a built residential use there. So the, the standards that were adopted in 2004 say that for a site to be eligible, it has to be contiguous to either a residential use or zoning district or parks or, or park or open space. It also has to have a minimum lot size of two acres. And so that's where we get this map uh, creating the eligibility. So not all sites are eligible for residential development. Um, also, the standards say that site review is required if it's a mixed use project. So um, a purely residential project might not need site review depending on what size it is, but as soon as there are non-residential uses, it needs site review. There's also standards related to environmental suitability and noise and a requirement that people, the owners and tenants have to sign a declaration of use acknowledging that they know that they are a residential use in an industrial zoning district. Interestingly, in the last 18 years since those standards were adopted, only four projects have been approved or built. So there's one project that's been built in Gun Barrel, one project that's been approved, there's one project that's been built in East Boulder, and one project that's been approved. So only four projects over the last 18 years have used these standards, and the standards haven't been updated since 2004. Sarah, I saw your hand. Yeah, sorry, Lisa. I just want to slightly disagree with your analysis of that only four projects have been approved. The entire transit village was industrial zone and has now been completely turned into, uh, I'm sure it's considered a mixed use development. So, and that, I think there must be ten, eight or 10 buildings there that are residential. So I think it's a miss, it's a, it's a, it's not totally accurate that only four projects have been approved in industrial areas or built. You've defined it in a very, very narrow way, and I think it's a little bit misleading. Well, maybe I can help clarify, Sarah, and I appreciate that. So the Transit Village was very intentionally rezoned comprehensively um, in accordance with the adopted TVAP area plan. So there was a functional rezoning to help support that intensity of redevelopment and the mix of uses there. Lisa is referring to a very specific section of the city's code that allows residential development to be built in industrial zones without a rezoning. So we've seen a very small fraction of the development community uh, take advantage of the standards that were drafted in 2004. Um, and I think that there's probably a myriad reasons, um, and I, I think Lisa's going to get to those, but I think that's um, just a little bit more specific um, in what it is that she was referring to. It's a specific code section that allows you to develop residential and property that's zoned industrial without rezoning it. And so. I, I really do, I really appreciate Charles that, that clarification, but I, again, much like my question about how much industrial land have we already lost in the last 30 years, like I, I know that you guys are thinking very specifically about the code but the, we're being asked to examine a policy, we're, we're gonna be asked to give feedback on a policy proposal, which isn't, which the, the details are in the code, 
But the reality is it's a, it's a policy approach and understanding that the, it hasn't only been four apartment buildings built in industrial areas, I think is very important for us as we think this through. No, I appreciate that. And that's helpful feedback for us as we move forward in the conversation. Laura. Quick question, if we're doing Q&A integrated into the presentation, um, what do you think have been the reasons why the parcels that are eligible have mostly not redeveloped? That's a great question. Also asked by our city council members when we presented this very similar presentation. Um, we tried to dig into this and I don't have a definite answer. I mean, I, I think that something has, it has to do with that only a percentage of sites actually are eligible, obviously. Um, so only certain sites have been eligible to take advantage of that. But I think that there are are larger things at play probably than just zoning. So market forces, things like that, um, that might be playing into why only um, four properties have taken advantage of this opportunity. Um, there was concern in 2004 about this, you know, similar to concerns now about residential development kind of overtaking industrial land. So that's why it is a fairly strict eligible um, eligibility. Um, so only a few parcels remain. And uh, as you can tell from the map, it's kind of a scattershot of what is eligible. So it's not necessarily following an, a logical pattern that might follow um, where sites might be desirable for development. Thank you. That's my best guess. And Mark. I, I want to be careful and not hijack uh, Lisa's presentation here, but um, Sarah was, uh, has been very direct about her concerns with the <clears throat> um, representation that it's more than only four properties that have uh, had residential development on them and so forth. So Sarah, my question is, is your point lamenting the loss of the industrial area at TVAP2 or is something else? I, I'm, um, or what, what, is, what is the lesson or the takeaway that you'd like us to uh, hear from your concerns? I, I want all the information that we can have since we have this conversation. So TVAP2 hasn't been Nothing's happened with TVAP2. And in fact, if, if I'm reading the map correctly, TVAP2 is not eligible for residential use. I believe I may not be reading the map correctly. So that's a whole other question. I'm concerned in general. <clears throat> of course, we need more housing, but I'm extremely concerned with the uh, exit the, the pre-existing loss of industrial zones and space which has led to small you know, businesses, some businesses leaving Boulder. Uh, we've talked about it in terms of East Boulder subcommunity plan and the impact on the, the, um, <clears throat> the company that provide, the lumber company that's by definition gonna disappear because its land now is gonna be more valuable than it was you know, a, a year ago. Um, and I want us to understand the full parameters of the conversation we're having. And for the staff, the conversation is about code, but I think for us, the conversation is about what's the right balance of industrial space and residential space, and how do we ensure that allowing more housing in some, all, none of the industrial zones, um, what that means for future protection of our industrial spaces. You know as well as I do that the value of a residential parcel is much higher than the value of an industrial parcel. The contiguity rule, which I've always had a problem with, but maybe not for the reason that it's as it's presented in the memo, the contiguity rule essentially creates the opportunity for um, a domino effect, um, which is you somebody builds a residential building because it meets the code in our industrial area. Now there's a contiguity for someone else to build residential and each 
slicing away of residential, uh, slicing away of, in, of industrial space undermines the small businesses and the industrial businesses and the heavy industrial manufacturing, which we don't have a ton of, um, those businesses that are part of the fabric of Boulder. Boulder's not just intent. I, I don't think anybody wants Boulder to just be a bedroom community um, and everyone has to commute out to go somewhere to go to work. Uh, so my cons I don't have an outcome that I want to see. I just want to make sure that we are fully we're thinking fully about all the parameters of this policy that we're being asked to give feedback on this potential policy. Okay, uh, I think this is these are excellent comments. I think uh, it would be good to hold them until the end here, where we can have a all of us can uh, participate in a coherent discussion. All right, great. I will keep on moving. There's just one more slide until we get to the question. So um, just a reminder, going back to that slide with the green box, that this is really pulling from the comprehensive plan, which is many years of public engagement and conversations um, and public forums and planning board meetings and city council meetings that come up with this policy. And so the policy says that housing should occur in a logical pattern in light industrial areas in proximity to existing and planned amenities. And what's interesting is that the policy really focuses on housing infill being in the areas that are zoned for industrial general, IG, and not in the IS or IM areas. So that's interesting direction from the comp plan um, related to housing in uh, industrial areas. It also says that housing infill should be encouraged in appropriate places near other residential uses or retail services. So. Um, I thought this was interesting. It validated a lot of what the public engagement responses were in the questionnaire about where housing locations would be appropriate. So with that framing, um, it leads us to our first question for you tonight. Um, does planning board support changes to the standards for residential development in industrial districts? And that would potentially make more sites eligible for residential uh, uses. So. Um, thanks to Charles' uh, clarification, it is really a surgical question um, related to those residential development and industrial district standards um, in order to implement that adopted comprehensive plan policy to encourage housing and fill in appropriate places. What's the best way to do that? This is a really challenging question. Uh, a lot of cities grapple with this. Um, but if we were to change the residential standards in industrial districts, um, it could include removing that contiguity requirement because it's not really resulting in housing in a logical pattern. You can tell from that map and the development that's occurred so far. Removing the minimum lot size uh, to make more sites eligible. Um, and then some ideas for what, what we could use as an assessment for whether sites are appropriate for housing would be um, guidance from subcommunity plans. Each one of those areas where we have industrial districts, we're lucky enough to have a subcommunity plan to look to, or very soon for East Boulder. Um, limiting residential development only to the IG zoning district. So right now it's allowed in IM, the industrial manufacturing with the use review, same as IG, but the comp plan guidance seems to lean towards just IG being appropriate for residential. Or there's other approaches where we could have standards related to proximity to transit or um, uh, proximity to parks or retail or things like that. So um, that's really the question we wanna frame for you tonight. Um, what the direction should be for updating these residential development and industrial district standards or whether um, we keep them as is. Look forward to the conversation. Okay. Well, I think uh, just just to frame our what happens now, I think uh, we'll have a discussion. We won't uh, come to a, a joint conclusion. I think this is a chance for us all to give our opinion and uh, staff will be able to get a sense of the issues that concern us. And I think that's what they're really seeking tonight. So it's not something that we have to take a vote on. So Laura, will you like um, to start? I'd love to. Uh, first, I, I have a question. So the current contiguity requirement is it has to be contiguous to residential or park, right? 
And so it sounds like we might be talking about substituting contiguity for some kind of proximity, right? Proximity to other residential, proximity to a park, proximity to uh, a transit corridor, um, proximity to a neighborhood center or, or a retail center. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, in general, I'm in favor of that. Uh, it's, it looks like the contiguity requirements um, has not worked out for a variety of reasons, has not actually led to sensible or logical um, encouragement of uh, appropriate redevelopment of housing within industrial zones. I really, um, you know, I, as you all know, I was on the East Boulder subcommunity plan working group, and I feel like that process was thorough, it was logical, um, staff did an awful lot of analysis on a parcel by parcel level to look at where housing might be appropriate and how to include housing in a way that did not um, detract from or discourage industrial. For example, having industrial on the first floor and residential above doesn't, it's, it's not an either or necessarily. It's not that we have to lose all of our industrial, we can have mixed use industrial. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of using guidance from the subcommunity plans as you know the the, the north star um, and if it seems appropriate to staff to substitute proximity some kind of proximity requirement for contiguity and maybe having some of those different types of things that you might have proximity to that that make sense for walkable neighborhoods which i think we're talking about in a future section um, but that makes sense here as well i i think that kind of planning um insight is important so um you know i we do need housing. We do need industrial. I don't think it's either or. I think they can live harmoniously together. And I think our subcommunity plans have worked really hard to make that possible. I will point out that we approved the East Boulder subcommunity plan. Um, and the current guidance for contiguity and what's appropriate in industrial areas will not allow what is in the East Boulder subcommunity plan. So we have to have some changes if we actually intend to implement that plan. Um, those are my initial thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Other? Sarah. Um, so I'm pretty uncomfortable with the, the term terminology used of assess, assessing whether sites are appropriate for residential development. And I'm uncomfortable with that because it's essentially totally objective, a uh, subjective. Um, and rather than being um, having some rules <laughs> that actually uh, define where and what can be built, um, uh, I I want to make sure that we don't eliminate the contiguity rule until we have a replacement. Um, and in watching the East Boulder sub community plan, understanding that now there's a year or two of like zoning changes that have to happen <laughs> in order to actually implement it. Um, that's a, a big period of time to have gotten rid of continuity without replacing it with something else. So I feel pretty strongly that whatever we do, cont contiguity has to stay in there until the thing we are replacing it with is created, whatever that thing is. Um, I'm a little, I like the idea of subcommunity plans because it does get you to, you know, the, the impulse that most people have that somehow things should weave together in some coherent, cohesive, human scaled way. But we don't actually have subcommunity plans or area plans for most of these places. Um, and so if we approve, if we propose moving forward with subcommunity plans or air and area plans as the tool that then determines what the balance is in any particular, what's currently an industrial zone. Um, we have to be committed to that. To, and there are a lot, there are voices in town. We heard them when the project from um, uh, Diagonal Plaza came up and we were pushing for a simultaneous area planning process while that building, while that development was underway, they, you know, there were some loud voices who were like, no, 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 that slows everything down. We don't need that. Well, we kind of do. If you want to create the kind of coherent sense of place, 
you need you need area plans or sub community plans. So I just want to make sure that if we if we say that's what we want, that we're we're committed to those processes. Um, uh, I want to also bring up. Um, so I'm a little concerned. I'm, I, I want to make sure that whatever it is that we is proposed to us um, meets uh, in terms of the residential work that's done, um, the needs of the missing middle. Um, because what has been built basically for the last 15 years, other than what was just approved at the Waldorf schools planning <laughs> has been apartment rentals that serves a, it serves a, a, a slice of the community, but there are a lot of people, it does not serve a lot of folks who in commute, who have families and wanna live in a house or a small town home or something. So I wanna make sure it is really important to me that that missing middle housing be front and center in the discussion of any kind of residential development in, in any industrial zone. Um, um, and let's see if I have other comments. Those are my, I have a bunch of others, but those are my basic concerns. Thank you. ML. Um, yes, hi, thank you, John. Um, I have some specific input on this question number one, and um, I'll just start with, uh, I. I think that if we are going to open industrial sites to residential within the use by right in the use um, process, that we I like the idea of limiting that use by right to the IG, but it seems that it would make um, sense to try to develop a, a saturation limit or in some way create um, maximum percentages or create some kind of, of thresholds that recognize that this is perhaps primarily an industrial zone, but housing will happen in it where the contextual um, relationships, whether adjacency, adjacencies and that sort of thing make sense to put housing in. But it seems that without, um, if, it if it becomes a use by right, that without some kind of specific uh, limiting factors, we will start to lose um, significant parts of our industrial zoning. So, so that's number one. And, and I would suggest that the IS um, is preserved. There's not much IS left in the city. And I think it is intended to provide those valuable services that we're seeing uh, leaving town because they can't afford or find um, the spaces. So if there is a way to IS, remains IS and it's about community services. Uh, I think that that would be an important um, part of the discussion of the industrial and residential. Um, the other thing, and I don't know that it is, um, it seems if we are going to increase the potential for residential development in the city, the trends that we have seen in the city of Boulder is that investors are buying up the housing that's being provided. And what this does obviously is it reduces the possibility for people to own houses and live in Boulder. We become a commodity. The housing becomes a commodity. And I think that exacerbates the potential for anybody to buy into uh, home ownership. Um, I saw a statistic uh, today, yesterday, 
that just talked about the percentage of investor um, purchasing of housing in Colorado is over 20%. And this has changed. This has grown by like 89% in the last two years. So it's a huge problem, I think, that is contributing to our housing a homeowner crisis. Sarah's talking about um, the missing middle. You know, where do the working population that wants to live and work in Boulder um, find housing that is um, not just available, but that they're not competing with an investor? These are people that are going to come to the city, work here, live here, be a working member of the community rather than speculative investors that see us for, you know, we're a great place to live and people want to live here and um, they're going to make a profit on it. So I don't know where that lands in the huge table. It might not, but I think that um, let's be very uh, conscious of we open up more land for residential development. We have to try to put uh, pieces in place to help guide those developments toward home ownership for people who want to actually live and contribute to the to, to Boulder. Thanks, I so think no. those are my comments. <laughs> Thank you for those. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So the residential development and industrial standards are tied to it being a use review. So it wouldn't be that residential would be a use by right. It would still be a use review. It's just whether those standards should be updated that the residential development is evaluated through. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Yeah. So um, would it be logical to try to put saturation limits in on those evaluation criteria? Um, I think, I mean, I think saturation limits are challenging to administer, so we'd have to think about how that would actually work and the nuts and bolts of that. Um, but certainly that's what this discussion is for, is just to mm -hmm. how do we determine which sites are appropriate. Right. Well, we had no problem putting them in on the ADUs, right? <laughs> the, these tiny little things in backyards got a big saturation limit imposed on them. So it, it you know, it, anyway, it's a tool and maybe we just need to think about tools and um, again to my point um, making sure that that those is industrial areas do not get infiltrated with residential opportunities because they will vanish you know they will vanish so and those are important those are important uses thank you thanks thank you lisa yeah, um, I'll try to be fairly brief just because I think a lot of other planning board members have spoken to a lot of what I wanted to touch on as well. Um, and that is just, you know, on, on the surface, the notion of allowing for more diverse use for allowing for residential and industrial districts, if there are a way to do it without losing our industrial land is attractive. You know, when, when I think of some of those industrial areas, um, as we've already talked about, you know, I think about service parking lots, I think about single story and so on and there. And I think, um, as you brought up, uh, you know, you, you can put, you know, loft space or offices or so on above industrial and there are ways to use both. But I share the concerns of other planning board members around not having our arms around how much industrial we've lost and the kind of industrial that we're losing. You know, we're getting a lot of very expensive industrial coming in, a lot of health sciences and so on, which are great. I'm not opposed to them, um, but we're losing a lot of, of the other use. And so I'll just echo that and not take up too much time, um, you know, but just say that it makes it hard for me to wholeheartedly support the idea, not because I'm opposed to the move in general, but because I don't know what it's going to do. And I don't know what is gonna happen overall and then what specific kinds of industrial are going to shift in and shift out, um, which I think is what we've heard from other planning board members too. So that's where I'm at on this one. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, John. Um, uh, so I'll also try to be brief. Um, I uh, support removing the uh, current 
contiguity uh, requirement or minimum lot size. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> that you can have housing in an inappropriate and poor location uh, that only breeds additional housing in a, in a poor and inappropriate location. Uh, so continu contiguity doesn't speak to necessarily to quality or to uh, appropriateness. It just speaks to proximity um, to something, to the same thing. So I, I support other standards. Um, I also support it not being so prescriptive, but, but again, I, I'm, I'm never in favor of just completely ad hoc. So I'm gonna ask a question. Wouldn't, uh, so we're talking about the use table. So I think you just said that any housing in an IG zone would go through a use review and likely a site review, or do I have that wrong? So in either, for the current standards, in either IG or IM, any type of residential use needs to go through a use review. If it's above two acres, or I might, I might be remembering wrong, if it's of a certain size, it also needs to go to site review, or if it has non-residential uses integrated into that residential. Um, and then separately, we also have site review thresholds, which are, I think right. Carl will know this off the top of his head, but over five acres or 100,000 square feet. Yeah, if, the, if it's over five acres, it does also trigger a site review along with the use review. And then it also depends on how much, how many units or how much floor area they're adding could trigger a site review as well. Or if they're ad, asking for setback modifications, that would put them into site review. Okay. So I, I, I concur with seemingly the entire board in having concern for uh, preserving small industrial uh, uses, whether it's uh, auto repair, what it could, you know, any number of things that we all eventually need. Gee, I, I need something welded for my garden thing, whatever it might be, welding shops, woodworking shops, um, people doing cabinetry, whatever, and, and that there is value in those uh, industries being located uh, within our city limits, that we want to be something beyond a, uh, a rich bedroom community that has none of those services there. So, um, so the only other uh, input I'd offer is on your third uh, arrow down here or other potential approaches. Um, certainly, I think that if we are talking about a small uh, industrial site owned by an individual um, that is uh, that that making the process um, available to them to add residential on the second floor and to expand upward while maintaining existing uses. Um, adding residential, maintaining existing uses, uh, I think it's something that the use, the use table should um, try to encourage as being in alignment with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. So I, I don't have specific suggestions on how to do that, but certainly I think that um, uh, deference should be uh, given to smaller industrial users smaller industrial building owners that may want to add residential uh, as a way of upping the value of their property, providing housing, and still and allowing uh, current industrial uses to remain because they're actually getting additional income from residential at the same site. So that's, that's my input. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh... See, I, I think uh, I have a, a few thoughts here, and then uh, we can do another circle around. I see Laura has her hand up also. Uh, but I'd, I'd just like to say that what, what you've heard from my colleagues uh, uh, on, uh, on concerns, I, I, I generally, I don't disagree with anything I've heard. But I have uh, two overriding uh, concerns or thoughts. 
One is that the implication that because there hasn't been very much housing built in industrial areas so far, that, that that's a failure of some kind. To me, uh, it's not clearly a failure. It's, it, we have an overriding concern of protecting those industrial areas for that purpose. And that's why those uh, standards that are in place now are there. And our concerns have not changed and neither have our objectives in that respect. We do feel additional pressure for housing for sure. And where it can be done without diminishing the uh, potential and existing industrial use of that land is, is reasonable. The, the second general concern I have is that there have been, and I, I participated in the East Boulder subcommunity plan, so I, I heard plenty of this there too. There was a lot of talk about using mixed use as a solution to the problem of allowing, of, of having both industrial and residential in the same area. But I have to say that I am aware of very few, if any, successful projects in the Boulder area where, where that has, has succeeded and, that, and where the existing businesses on the first floor are still there after construction. And I think that happens usually because uh, you know, the landlords try and raise the rent uh, when they improve the land and that drives out uh, what we were trying to save. Um, so, so I think the, the citywide context is extremely important in this. And we've referred to it a couple of times earlier this evening about, you know, citywide, how much have we, how much industrial land have, have we lost or, or gained? Maybe, maybe that needs to be allowed too. I don't want to prejudge that. But so far, I haven't seen any analysis of that in a coherent way beyond what, what staff presented in, in a very specific code code-related uh, uh, matter. But for example, what, what Sarah talked about with the uh, transit village area, that is of citywide concern, and yet it, it's not being covered in this analysis, and I think it needs to. So, okay. Laura, you have some more points. Thank you. I just wanted to touch back on, on a few things. One, just a, a fact, clarification thing. Um, you know, I, I agree with Sarah that if if we're saying that subcommunity plans are going to be the, the guiding light or the North Star, then we need to be committed to having them. Lisa, did I hear you say that we already have subcommunity or area plans for the areas of Boulder that have industrial areas being Gun Barrel, North Bar Boulder, and East Boulder, soon yeah. to be East Boulder? Correct. Um, the North Boulder and Gun Barrel are um, a little bit older subcommunity plans, but we, they are some of the only areas that we do have subcommunity plans for. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I go back to my comment that I think the subcommunity plans, um, you know, I think that that answers some of ML's concerns about saturation limits, because I know at least with the East Boulder subcommunity plan, there was a very deliberate effort to say some areas, there will be delineated areas of change. It won't be everywhere and the areas of change will be the places where housing is most appropriate based on a whole bunch of criteria, not, not just you know an arbitrary or subjective standard, but looking at things like proximity to transit and proximity to uh, retail and, and having walkable neighborhoods and services for the buildings that are there. Um, so I, I do think that the subcommunity plans you know, there's a lot of public input that goes into them, and there's a lot of staff thought that goes into them. There's a lot of outreach to the neighboring businesses. So I think those are our best chance to really get the people who care about that neighborhood. You know, it's it's very hard for people to think about things on a citywide level, but if it's your subcommunity, then it, there's a better chance that you'll get involvement from the right people. So I, I really do think that that is probably the the best way, um, and you know, linked up with some criteria that may be used to develop those subcommunity plans. Um, as far as the city council's comments, I just want to 
say that I supported this. I read the city council's comments and I didn't see anything I disagreed with. So I want to put a marker in that I, I support the city council's comments. Um, I forgot to mention minimum lot size in my earlier comments. I do support doing away with the minimum lot size requirement, but you know, replaced by these other things having to do with the sub community plans and things like proximity to transit and proximity to parks and retail and that kind of thing. Um, as, as far as missing middle goes, you know, I, I think it's very, very difficult to integrate missing middle into uh, industrial areas. I, I think the best way to integrate housing into, into industrial is to build up, and that is generally condos or apartments, as opposed to duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, the kinds of things that you want for missing middle. If you're going to put missing middle in industrial area, you're almost certainly going to have to demolish and do away with the industrial use rather than having a mixed use. Um, so I, I think missing middle is something we absolutely should be talking about in the next phase when we talk about uh, neighborhoods and neighborhood centers and things like that. Um, I think there was some opportunity to do missing middle in East Boulder and that primarily took the form of um, work, work live units where it might be like a, a craft shop in the front and a house in the back or over it. So I think there's some opportunity, but I don't think it's our best opportunity for missing middle. I agree with ML that we should be protecting the IS zones, that that, that should be one of the things that is not fair game uh, to, to have housing in the industrial service. Um, and I think those are all my comments. Thank you. OK, Sarah. Um, so just FYI, the uh, gun barrel subcommunity plan is, is more of a discussion than a plan. And because gun barrel is this weird mix of the city and the county, it's not a very, co it's not cohesive because all it was was the city. Um, and I think it might be worth our thinking, encouraging a, a second take a second stab at a gun barrel subcommunity plan that would be more comprehensive, um, especially now that there's been some stuff that's been built and the residents there and the businesses there have some sense of what has worked and what hasn't. But also, and this may not even be doable, but to see if it could be done in conjunction with the county residents who live there so that you really do come up with. So it's not just this appendage that's out there where all the stuff we, the city doesn't want to think about kind of gets dumped into gun barrel, but instead can become a more, it's not a particularly coherent area. Um, so that's one thought. Um, the subcommunity plan in North Boulder is from 1994, I believe, or 1996. Um, so, and there's not a whole lot of, the, the industrial areas that are still industrial, um, you know, they are, there's a lot of storage units. <laughs> there's some artist spaces. There's more storage units. Um, it might not be the best use of industrial zoning, zoned land, but um, it is what it is. I don't know that the city would want to reconsider that area plan. And then I'm not prepared to uh, ignore the needs of missing middle in industrial areas if we're going to build housing. Um, I appreciate, Laura, your argument that it should go up and therefore it'll be apartments, but I, we build a lot of apartments. We build a lot of apartments. We build almost no new townhomes or houses or small cottages or cottage courtyards or anything. <clears throat> and I think we, it's time for us to, um, to put our foot down and, and commit ourselves to missing middle everywhere we're gonna build residential. And I, I, that's just a, I'm pretty, pretty committed to that. And, you know, in our last iteration of planning board, um, before we had three new members, there was a lot of commitment on missing middle, a lot of discussion. We were all trying to pull in the same direction. And I really hope we can um, bring that conversation back to this newly constituted planning board, because it really does, it's an issue that we cannot just keep pushing down the pike and assume will be solved somewhere else. So I will close with that. Thanks. ML. Thank you, John. Um, I have a question for Lisa and Carl. Um, and yes, I, I was assuming that these 
land use table uh, <clears throat> use table changes were going to push us to a simpler way of both articulating what we want as an outcome and a simpler way for <laughs> people working in the city to develop properties to um, to actually get their properties through the process. It, it's, a, it's a very onerous prop process in the city. Uh, so my question is, um, why wouldn't we put the careful parameters that would give us the outcomes we want and let the use tables direct use by right opportunities for people rather than every time I mean, we're having this big discussion on residential in an in industrial area and yet they'll all have to come through a robust city planning review and planning review and city council. It's a huge, huge um, uh, effort on everybody's part. I mean, why don't we just make the correct articulation of our, of our um, use parameters so that we get what we want? Rather than assume, make this is probably why you've only had four. You know, it, it's a huge, it's a huge process for anybody to go through this with the city. It, it's it's not a small, even to just put a project through use by right. It's a it's a it's a very onerous, um, and I think that if I listen to some of the things that are being said, it's like let's make it easier, not harder. If we want more residential. I think, you know, the idea that focus it in IG, determine what the right parameters are, which, you know, I was suggesting a, a limiting factor of a percentage of saturation, whatever. Um, but let's get the right parameters in place and let people, let people build them. I, why don't we do that? Is there, is it charter? What? No, um, that's a great point. I mean, that's certainly something that we can do. We could make it an allowed use and simply have, if you remember when we talked about the technical updates, have the brackets mm -hmm. in the use table, which just means there are standards associated right. with that. So you could make residential and allowed use. Um, use review is intended to be kind of a case-by-case -case analysis of whether a use is appropriate in a certain location based um, on its impact and things like that. So, um, just based on the sensitivity of residential and industrial and comments like that, we've kind of stuck along the line of the use review that we have now and just updating what those standards are. Um, but that's certainly something that we can consider and put forward as an option. I'd be interested it. to hear what the pros and cons from the staff's perspective, you know, your and Carl's, um, what would be the reasons not to simplify everything for everybody? And you know, I, this is not an answer for today. This is just, you know, in in our next in our next little team meeting, um, you know, it'd be interesting to hear why yeah. we aren't that isn't just the go to. Yeah, we could certainly analyze the different options and what the pros and cons are, um, and get back to you through our liaison group, and then also through the next time that this comes to planning board. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's can I, can I just colloquy more. quickly yeah, on that? Ahead, just just real quickly. I think ML, par that gets partially taken care of with um, the rezoning associated with the subcommunity plan. So when you rezone to a mixed use industrial, then I don't think that that has to go through a, a use review or a site review necessarily. That just becomes an allowable use in a mixed use industrial. So if you rezone it, you don't have to do the use review, but I, I, it, it seems like this is trying to preserve industrial for industrial, but allow for exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis, which goes to use review. So there's a way to do it by right, and that's to rezone, it sounds like, to mixed-use industrial. But just, just my thought, my two cents. Okay. Lisa, why don't we move ahead to the next one? All right. One that will be just as fun, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next big topic is related to offices in industrial districts. 
Um, some policy background, again, this one gets a little zoning wonky, so bear with me, but um, right now in the use table, we have two different types of offices. So we have both a professional office, which is like a lawyer's office, accounting office, real estate office, that type of office. We also have a technical office, which is more like an engineering firm or software development, that kind of thing. We did attempt to try to clean up that definition to make it a little less vague in uh, module one. So if you think of technical office, we also added some language that they're involved with the production of something. So whether that's a goods or um, like a tangible good or digital good, that's what uh, technical office is. So like a surveying company or something like that. So we have those two uses and that actually dates back to the same comprehensive rezoning study back in 1997. So this uh, bifurcation is actually very uncommon among other cities in the country. There's um, only a few that do anything even close to similar, I'm splitting these two, but it comes from that time in 1997. The intent was to um, limit speculative office buildings in industrial districts, support startups, preserve the industrial areas for industrial uses, but also recognizing that there's a need for offices that are more technical or industrial in nature. And so that's where this kind of split between two different kinds of offices came from. So now, our, how it's been since 1997 is those professional offices, things like lawyers offices are completely prohibited in industrial districts, uh, but the technical offices are allowed with almost no limitations. They do have a size limit in the IS district, but no limits anywhere else. Um, it's been a challenging tool to use to implement this policy over the last 25 years. Um, if you think of how office life has evolved in the last 25 years, offices have changed a lot and what the definitions kind of hinged on, it can be a very fuzzy line between what is a professional office and a technical office. So a good example that I like to use is like a patent lawyer, technically is a lawyer's office. So that would be a professional office, but he is involved with um, the production of maybe like industrial prototypes or something like that. So there's that fuzzy line between what the use is, um, what the difference is between these two different office uses, what the difference of impact is, um, to that actual structure, to that site. Um, and it's often a, a difficult thing for business owners to understand whether they are going to be actually allowed in the space that they are trying to lease um, in an industrial zone. So it's challenging from business owner, property owner, and also staff implementation perspective as well. Um, there's not a lot of, I would say, conceptual understanding of what the difference is. It's not something that commonly people think of as there being two different kinds of offices. And there's also no real guidance in the subcommunity plans or um, comp plans that guide where these different types of offices are appropriate or not. It really all comes from that 1997 comprehensive rezoning study. So we wanted to bring this up during module two because it was something that was done very intentionally for the industrial districts. I would say it's more of a um, technical fix to try to make it more understandable for people to use the code um, and to understand where these different uses are allowed. But obviously there's policy implications as well um, because of the policy background that this comes from from the 90s. So the question that this leads to is, um, does planning board support the consolidation of technical office and professional office use types into one generalized use type? And then beyond that, um, if these two types are consolidated right now, like I said, professional office is completely prohibited in industrial districts, technical offices are allowed. So would we go with saying that offices are allowed or would we go with saying they're prohibited or is there kind of a middle ground where maybe they're allowed in some circumstances or with some limitations um, and, or guardrails for that? So. Curious, very interested to hear your thoughts on this and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, Mark. You're muted, Mark. Sorry, my answer to the first question is, well, of course. <laughs> I think we should combine them and uh, it's, it's as a practical matter, it's, uh, in fact, before before the meeting, I was trying to explain to my wife 
what, what some of our topics were tonight and I used this and, you know, she rolled her eyes. It was like, oh my God. But I, I think that the, 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 the lesson for us in this question and this topic is that our city, us, we, so I'm not, I'm not pointing at others, I'm, I'm pointing at, uh, at us collectively, tries to put too fine a point on many things. Uh, and to ML's uh, request that, why don't we just say what we want and then we'll, we'll get it and people can do things by right, the code will be clear. And I think that, yeah, I support that. But at the same time, when we end up with this sort of uh, distinction without a difference, many times it actually uh, is a barrier to achieving the larger goals that we are actually trying to achieve. So in, in this particular case, this is an example to me of uh, way too fine a point on something. Um, uh, so that's, that's my input on the first one. On the second one, um, I think for the most part uh, in today's world, and today's world is different than it was two years ago or three or four years ago, um, the market will take care of, uh, we will have, we, we have some surpluses of office space um, and the market will value the industrial spaces for industrial users and office spaces for office users and, and, that, and that we shouldn't um, spend a great deal of effort trying to uh, delineate or massage uh, exactly what percentage of what type of office is allowed in what type of industrial zone. Um, I think the, the market will will take care of that quite handily. Thank you. Sarah. Um, I'm gonna disagree with Mark on some stuff. Um, the, the problem with the market driving everything is that the market is driven by profit motive and office space makes an investor more money than industrial space. And we've already seen that starting to happen long before East Boulder subcommunity plan, but we're seeing it happen in the Flatirons Business Park where those very unattractive 1950s, 60s style industrial spaces where the printer is and where you know various industrial companies are are being bought and torn down and what's being built are all you know fancy <clears throat> excuse me, fancy schmancy office buildings. So I I think it's um, in general, I think we want to make sure this goes back to the same argument I've been making before, which is we want those industrial spaces, industrial zones to be protected for industrial uses. Um, now that doesn't mean no offices, but I think we really need to think about, again, how to find the, a good balance. Um, in terms of the um, office technical versus um, professional offices, um, you know, what's, what's described in the professional offices is kind of like medical, it's the same as medical, you know, where it's an office and there's, you know, there's a space and people drive, unfortunately people have to drive to work. Um, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of commercial space for those kinds of offices in Boulder. Uh, perhaps in time we'll need more, but we have a lot of commercial space right now <clears throat> for that. Um, the, the, I, and I don't, think I, I'm a little concerned that um, the speculative nature of, of not spec, that's the wrong way to say it, the impulse um, from the market to build the, the kinds of buildings with the best ROI um, might undermine our efforts to protect our industrial space if we allow professional offices in industrial, to, to, if we don't have some sort of limit on, in, on office spaces in industrial zones and then in terms of the technical office, I, I don't know whether if the decision by the staff and council is to just meld the two, then this point is moot. But I feel like the part of the problem is that the technical office des description or definition is, is, um, 
is not totally accurate. So you have an interior design firm down as, uh, um, let me, let me double check. You have an interior design firm down as office technical, but the definition of office technical is that you don't have clients coming to visit. Well, of course, interior designers, of course, have clients coming to visit. Um, I'm thinking of the, there's a lighting store that's over on 33rd and something, I can't remember what it's called, but the only way to go see what they have is to go to their, to their place of business, which is in an industrial area. So I feel like maybe, um, and this kind of segues with what Mark was saying, but in trying to define things, maybe the problem is we've defined them the wrong way. <laughs> like, um, and, and I don't have a solution, but um, I feel like we've tried to use language that doesn't quite capture what the point of separating these two things out were. One was offices can be in office buildings. Industrial can only be in industrial zones. And, and we want to protect those industrial zones. So I don't, I don't know if I think it's okay to meld the two. I would, I think I'd prefer a middle step first of seeing if they can be redefined in a way that advances our policy goals um, first. And then if, if it can't be, you know, then I'll, I'll reconsider. But <clears throat> so those, that's my comment. Okay, thanks. Laura. So I, I would support consolidating the two office types just because I think it's, it, I sympathize with the plight of staff and uh, business owners and um, you know, potential tenants of trying to figure out which office type you are um, and that uses can change over time and technology. You know, I have several friends who are therapists that used to see clients in office and then during COVID, they saw them strictly uh, you know, by Zoom and now they're back to some clients by Zoom and some in person and it, it, I think it's just I don't I don't think it's easy to make that division. I wish it were because I think that there's an intuitive, oh yeah, if if nobody visits and you're just focused on supporting a service, you know, or creating a product, you're a technical office. But I just think life is messy. And I think um, you know, who knows what the businesses of the future are going to look like. So I, I do think that this is a distinction that it would be very hard to administer, especially, um, you know, <laughs> given how things evolve. So I would support consolidating it, but I do support having some guardrails because, I, you know, I empathize with the concern that we don't want office space taking over industrial. Um, and I wish I had paid more attention during the East Boulder subcommunity plan process to understand exactly what criteria were used during that process. But I do think that it, um, it gave a good model for how to have office space but only in, in certain places. Like I think, for example, most of the place types do not allow office space on the first floor. First floor has to be industrial. And then you can have in some zones, office space above in, and then residential. And in some places it, it's only residential. Um, but I think the criteria that were used to develop those place types, I think would provide some good insight into when is office space appropriate and how do you keep it from taking over the whole the whole zone. And, and some of that, again, I think it's worked out through subcommunity planning. I think Sarah makes a great point that the North Boulder subcommunity plan and gun barrel subcommunity plans should be uh, updated. I know that that's a little difficult right now because we have, I think, uh, eight subcommunities in Boulder that have never had a subcommunity plan and they're probably in the planning queue before revisiting anybody. And then hopefully we'll get on a good cycle where each subcommunity plan is updated like every 20 years, something like that. Um, but, but maybe there's an argument for having North Boulder and Gun Barrel jump the queue because of this importance of um, the industrial spaces and preserving the few industrial spaces that we have and putting a little bit more thought into how do we have office space in these particular areas that include industrial zones um, using the model of the East Boulder subcommunity plan, which I think can help uh, speed up that process. That's, you know, maybe we don't have to do a whole subcommunity plan revisit, but maybe we just revisit this question of where is office space appropriate, where is residential appropriate in those zones, given the code changes and given the potential reliance on subcommunity plans as a a um, a guiding force. Thank you, ML. Thank you, John. Um, 
So I would agree with the first sentence that uh, we should have one um, office type and definition in the industrial area. This is not the major use there. Um, and I, I do think that the limiting factor should be that it supports industry. So as that office gets defined, um, there should be a direct connection to um, in industrial supporting office rather than you know try to make a percent or, or whatever. Uh, if we're allowing industry, then we know what kind of industry we're allowing. And then we make the definition for the office to be supporting and subservient. In other words, they're, they're the lesser use of the big in industrial use. So it's a hierarchy that is created in the, in the use table on office being a, a second tier use and clearly subordinate to um, industrial. But I do think that, um, you know, let's not overcomplicate it with, with more than one kind of office. And let's just give it enough definition that is again reliant and pointing to the use itself. Thanks. Lisa, uh, did you have some thoughts? Yeah. Um, again, I think generally agreeing with what I'm hearing from other board members and just keeping in mind that we're providing feedback and ideas to staff rather than formal direction. Um, I like the idea of simplification and the idea of consolidation. And then um, I kind of second some of the stuff we've heard about being thoughtful about not necessarily putting overly prescriptive terms on, but just thinking about the limitations um, that might be needed, you know, to make sure that we don't have um, unintended consequences or shifting of uh, balances and uses um, that we're not actually going for. So kind of echoing what other folks have said. Okay, well, I guess, let's see, it's my turn maybe. Or, or no, Mark, you did you have a chance to weigh in on? Oh, okay. Well, I I certainly uh, sympathize with the desire to simplify. Uh, I have a question for for Lisa and and may, maybe Charles or Carl. Um, how how have you been enforcing this so far, or have you been? Carl can give more. Um color to this, but I think that um, it's really difficult to administer. So it's case by case when a business license comes in, they give a written description of what their use is. And it's um, kind of a judgment call of how you have to. And, and the issue is that um, people know the difference between professional and technical office. So they'll try to play up the um, lack of client contact in order to be called a technical office, uh, because that really is the only dividing line, it's not something we can necessarily enforce because um, uh, without going out and watching every office and seeing how many clients are coming and going. Um, so it's case by case with the, each business license that comes through. And that's why it's um, a challenging tool to use to administer this policy. But I see, yeah. I, I know Charles and Carl. Have yeah, no, say. I think that's really well said, Lisa, and I, I won't take up any more time. Um, I guess I would add when we find out that there's a business that's operating outside of the confines of the license that we issued, we try to work with them to course correct that rather than, um, you know, being too heavy handed and sometimes that works better than others, but um, I think it's exactly why it would be helpful for us to be able to clarify this um, in our regulations at the staff level we spend a lot of time working directly with applicants. Um, trying to understand uh, each one of their operational characteristics um, so that we're not running afoul of the regulations. But um, I think Lisa's spot on in this case. So, so you deal with this mostly through the business licensing process rather than asking uh, to see who, who's likely to rent available offices or anything like that. That's correct. Typically, by the time we see a business license, there's a lease signed. 
So it's not the optimal time in the process to be reviewing it. Right. Okay. Well, that that's very interesting. I my my response to this question is that I certainly understand why this distinction was made in the first place because speaking as a as someone who could be classified either as a technical type or a professional type in my engineering consulting business uh and uh, i i understand the, the sorts of you know confusion that can arise here in terms of classification but at the same time if we want to make sure that we don't open the doors to all of the industrial land being taken over by by office space because people are calling themselves technical offices. I think uh, it, it may be appropriate to have a different definition that is easier to administer than the one we have here. But I do think that that we need to continue to try and reach that objective of distinguishing between what is an office associated with some production facility and what is a, just a technical office, just an, an office that people go into work and aren't necessarily associated with some factory or production or research facility. So, uh, so I, I do not, uh, until we have that distinction clarified, I don't support consolidation. Uh, of these two terms. Mark. So I, I want to um, disagree with uh, both John and ML. I think I'm disagreeing with John and ML. Um, <laughs> I must not have been very clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I made my living for 30 uh, some years in heavy manufacturing. Now, I was selling heavy manufacturing, but I was selling foundry work, stampings, castings, injection molded plastic parts, highly mechanical, industrial manufacturing. Uh, and some of the foundry stuff is, is, is as wild and industrial as industry gets. Uh, dating, you know, investment casting is an ancient process. Um, and all of those businesses that I, uh, I sold for involved legal contracts and um, involved uh, understandings between customers and, uh, and manufacturers uh, with, with contractual relationships. They all involved sales efforts. They all involved accounting efforts. They all involved um, CAD work. And, and sometimes the person doing the CAD work was 10 steps away from the foundry. Sometimes they were 10 miles away from the foundry, but it, it, it all involved various things. And so I, I would support, um, I understand the concern of we don't want uh, our industrial areas to be subsumed by um, a bunch of offices. I understand that. But I think that rather than trying to finesse um, these distinctions that create uh, myriad problems for, for staff, that it is a physical distinction as Laura uh, pointed out, okay, great, have the law firm on the second floor, maintain the industrial uh, on the first floor, have, have the sales office, whatever it might be, second, third floor, have the residents up there, but we, we specify in specific zones that industrial uses um, are the dominant use on the first floor. And as we build up, um, then you can you can do other things on the on the second floor, including you very well might do industrial uses on the second floor. We're used to in the, in the U, in most of the U.S. this idea of industries on the first floor, and if there's something above it, well, it's 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 something lightweight. You know, uh, I, I sold for companies that had four and five story uh, foundries in old industrial wool mills uh, that used to make blankets and now make castings. And so anyway, you can have industry running vertically as it is in many parts of the world and you can have, uh, but anyway, I, I, I prefer the, the physical distinction that's easy to administer versus trying to finesse whether or not someone 
is directly associated with a industrial manufacturing process because I could contend that almost every business process out there relates to manufacturers and industrial processes. Okay. Well, Lisa, you've heard from all of us. <laughs> Good luck with uh, making sense of it. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a follow up if it's okay to just kind of dig in a little bit more on this question. <laughs> Sorry, if um, just because it's been percolating in my mind for many weeks now. Is there so I understand the did, like whether there's a physical distinction or a definition distinction, but I'm curious if there's our thoughts about um, the four different industrial districts that we have. If there, I, I've heard several comments about protecting the IS zones for those service industries. Um, we also have the IM, which is more specific for manufacturing. Would there be an appetite that, um, similar to kind of what we were saying about IG for residential, if IG were, were to be more open for any type of office, but maybe there was more restriction in IS or IM, is that something that people would be amenable to? And then maybe in the IG, um, there would be either a definition distinction or physical distinction of where those offices might be allowed. I'm sorry to throw something at you that's not on a screen. It's just all the conversation has gotten me thinking. Yeah, that's good. Well, colleagues, any response, um, to Lisa? ML? I, I have a thought, Lisa, and that would be, you know, as I was suggesting that the quote, office function um, have a be in direct support to the industry if there can be some definition of that office that links it to the industry definition in the zone I wouldn't limit it out of any of the districts because to Mark's point you know, I can see I'm an architecture firm and if I'm just doing architecture for clients, no, I wouldn't be in an industrial zone, but I'm also an inventor and have a building system. And if I'm building my building on site, yeah, I'm gonna have an architecture studio there to support that, that building system. So um, I think if there's a direct relationship to the primary zone use, then, there it shouldn't be questioned because you don't want to impede, especially the smaller businesses, you know, the ability to have their bookkeeper on site, you know, or or, or whatever it might it might require. Um, I don't think that this is about creating obstacles for people as much as it is to support the primary use, which is industry. Thanks, Amal. Yeah, it's, a, it's challenging because I think almost every business has some kind of office function. So we do allow like accessory office space to any business, um, but it's kind of the bigger off, like a full on office um, question. But yeah, thanks. It's helpful. Mark. Um, I can't really answer your question directly, but I, I will answer it this way. I find that the four industrial zones to be another potentially unnecessary distinction. If I am a, uh, an industrial design firm and I have a prototype uh, printed circuit board assembly uh, line or, or a small um, 3D printer, et cetera. And, and anyway, there's just, um, I question the value of, of breaking out our industrial zones in the four and the way you have with four um, that again there's lots of bleed over there's lots of gray area and um, I'm not sure exactly what the benefit is to having that particular distinction so I haven't answered your question I've just raised another but that's the best I can do thanks. no that's helpful thanks Sarah I just want to concur with what ML said. Laura? Um, to answer Lisa's question, I think it's potentially useful to think of the different uh, industrial zones as having different characteristics. 
And I guess I would just encourage Lisa to look at the place types in the East Boulder sub community plan and see if there's anything in there that can offer useful guidance. Like I'm looking particularly at the, I'm looking at it right now, the hands-on industrial place type and the innovation TOD non-residential place type and the innovation TOD residential. And a lot of thought went into thinking about what's allowed on the ground floor, what's a conditional use on the ground floor, what's allowable above the ground floor. And I, I, I think perhaps, you know, I, I am not a planner, but perhaps those things could offer a model for how you might think about some of those industrial zones when you come back to us. Great, thanks. Okay, any other thoughts on question number two? Okay, shall we move ahead then? Sure. Um, so we will move into the neighborhood module. We'll stop thinking about industrial for a second, but I did just want to um, highlight a couple other changes that have been raised through public input or the planning board subcommittee, um, just to kind of get these on your radar, see if there's any initial red flags, but things that we're thinking really to target that policy about mix of uses, offering a mix of uses in industrial areas. So one of those is thinking about live work units and making those more allowable in more districts and also um, refining the definition because the definition right now is limited to the work function has to be only an industrial use. So maybe expanding that to commercial uses as well to just make these more permissible around the city. Um, secondly, manufacturing definitions are um, in, uh, more typically in cities, there's like a light manufacturing, medium manufacturing, heavy manufacturing. We have manufacturing and manufacturing with potential for offsite impact. So just trying to think through how we can clarify that to better support our small scale manufacturing uses um, and just better define where those lines are. Another kind of fuzzy line that's hard to administer there. Um, schools has been something that's been raised through the public input throughout this process. Um, private colleges are allowed in some of the industrial districts, but private elementary, middle and high schools are not um, public elementary, middle, and high schools are. So that's just something we've been getting um, public input related to. So it's something we want to address in this module as well. Um, restaurants are actually allowed in industrial districts, but we have standards that limit them to not be permitted on major streets. So we're thinking about um, to be able to offer those mix of uses, offer more locations for restaurants, uh, eliminating those standards that restrict the locations of restaurants. And then finally, opening up potentially the opportunity for retail and personal services. So personal services are things like hair salons and bakeries. Um, those are currently both pro prohibited uh, retail and personal services in the industrial districts, but to get at that 15 minute neighborhood where people are able to access those services, we're thinking about opening that up to a limited size. So maybe like 2000 square feet, uh, small retail um, or personal services in the industrial district. So, just wanted to get those on your radar because um, those are some of the other uses. I think residential and office are kind of the big topics, but these are um, also something that we're thinking about with module two. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Lisa, thanks for bringing those up. Um, this issue with retail sales and personal services in industrial areas, to me, that seems like that would follow on if you end up deciding to use um, area planning and subcommunity plans as the framework, because um, otherwise it's just like plunking something down because it's now allowed. Um, so I, I would, I would, um, I guess my response is that that seems like a follow-on decision <laughs> once you figure out what's what are the tools that best enable the city to find that right balance of residential and um, and uh, industrial. Um, and then everything else would follow from there, everything including what type of housing might be built and what kind of retail would be available and what the plate sizes would be and all that stuff. In terms of the live work units, um, I think it's an interesting idea to expand the definition to include commercial, but uh, I think you gotta be super careful um, about where that is allowed. Um, I mean, this may be specifically only for as a housing type in 
industrial areas, but you know, I'm sure there are folks who'd be who live in RL1 who'd be perfectly happy to have a commercial thing happening in their next door. <laughs> and I'm also sure there are folks who would not be happy about that. Um, so I would just be really, I would, I'd move kind of slowly on that until you really, until the city's determined where the, where you could change the definition, like if, if it's only in industrial zones or I would just be super careful about that. Okay. Other thoughts? Well, all right. If no one uh, has any golden thoughts here, all right. We can move on. All right. We'll move on to module three, which is related to neighborhoods. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is, we haven't begun the work necessarily for module three. So that's going to be a different uh, framing of questions. It's more of just telling you the background of what we've heard so far and trying to get some direction of what we should be thinking about in planning for uh, module three related to neighborhoods and neighborhood centers. So um, the focus for module three is really um, this is where the ro most robust public engagement is planned. This is where we really need to work with the neighborhoods to identify the desired land uses, um, any potential changes throughout the four years of this project. We've always known that this part was going to be um, the heaviest lift in terms of public engagement and what we um, want to reach out to the community and ensure that we're really um, identifying those desired land uses that uh, the, bear the use table might be a barrier for. And so we have um, also the great goals that were worked on by the planning board subcommittee that are guiding us for this work, encouraging 15 minute neighborhoods, supporting mixed use nodes along corridors and supporting walkable neighborhood centers of varying scales throughout the city. So that's where we're going to address where the use table and the standards might be in conflict with the Boulder Valley comp plan. Um, again, incorporating there was, this has been kind of the, um, main topic probably of interest related to the use table is this module three. Um, as much as I loved all the technical and functional things from module one, um, this one is definitely the one that uh, gains the most interest and will incorporate significant work from the planning board subcommittee. There's lots of recommendations and areas of focus that have already been thought through. Um, we'll also be investigating whether there are certain areas in the city that might be appropriate for small scale mixed use. So areas of homogenous neighborhoods where there might be standards or allowances made to incorporate some non-residential uses or services into uh, largely residential areas or whether in, that's incorporating additional residential uses into mostly um, commercial areas. And then we'll also be reviewing the mix of uses that are permitted um, in our neighborhood centers. So those are kind of the focuses that we've identified so far, some of the main uses that we're going to be looking at include restaurants. If you've um, looked at our code, restaurants might be the most complicated thing, uh, most complicated standards in Boulder for some reason. So um, hopefully trying to simplify those while not losing what the um, important policy backgrounds that created those. We did clean those up a bit in the module one, but just reassessing those and seeing if there's any barriers uh, related to those standards. Um, looking at offices, again, as related to these different parts of the city, retail sales, personal services, different housing types, speaking to um, kind of the missing middle conversation that we've been having tonight. Um, again, live work um, outside of the industrial zoning districts and also home occupations. So those are kind of identified uses from the Public Planning Board subcommittee and the input that was received in 2019 and 2020 um, that we're, we're focusing on as um, the, the focus for this. I see Sarah's hand. Um, ML, why don't you go first? I, I just oh, have a definition question. What's a home occupation? Is so that a home, work? No, it's not. So it's actually a separate use type for um, occupations that people can do from their house, which I guess I do every day. <laughs> but uh, specific things, I, Carl, I don't know if you know the standard specifically or sure. um, if Charles knows like common home occupations. It is defined in our land use code. It's mostly focused on someone who's running a business from their house. Uh, there are criteria that have to be met, but it's something that's generally 
over the counter. It doesn't require any kind of special review. Um, I think we do like an affidavit, like they just agree to yeah. the criteria. For the most part, it's really focused on, you know, there not being any um, employees that come to the site or it tries to avoid, um, you know, a lot of customers coming to the site. It might be something like a piano teacher, you know, where you have a student who comes for a couple hours and then later on another student comes. Um, so it's meant to be low intensity in a residential neighborhood. Yeah, and, um, um, there's some um, criteria that I talk about parking impacts, but I think it's really designed to support people who are, um, you know, at this point kind of working remotely in sales, for example, from their home and not servicing clients on site. Great. So it's not live work because live work is clients and that sort of thing actually come to the it's an actual business that is open to the public. Is that right. And, and also the definition of live work right now is that the, the work use is industrial. Um, so yeah, that's part of that's part of the issue we're trying to sort out. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> so I have um, a comment and I have a question. So the comment is as somebody who was part of the previous subcommittee conversations, I don't necessarily um, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, in agreement. I, I, that's not the wrong word. I feel I have some uh, some concerns about the string of pearls and the 15 minute neighborhood concept. I think it was more of a predetermined. That's what the subcommittee was going to talk about, and therefore that's what we talked about, rather than agreement by the subcommittee that that was totally what we need to focus on. Um, there was a lot of conversation about it, but um, uh, again, this uh, putting um, non-residential uses into a residential neighborhood has appeal for some people and it does not appealing for other people. And um, <clears throat> I just think we need to really think that needs to be really thought through before the city like barrels forward with that. And then in terms of the string of pearls, like I don't quite get what that is. And I think that one, the area that there was the most agreement on was the neighborhood centers, which was tended to be thought of as the BC1 one, BC one and two zones, which are those vast shopping areas <clears throat> where all that land is just wasted on parking. And if you can reimagine those areas as more, um, high density, high intensity housing, retail, <clears throat> and some public space, then you end up with these neighborhood centers that people who live in the, in the single family areas around them can go to for all of their shopping needs, which addresses some of the, what I would consider a 15 minute neighborhood versus somebody wants to put a yoga studio on the corner. Like that doesn't constitute for me a, a neighborhood serving kind of concept. Um, my, my question, I, I have another comment and a question. So in the, when you listed the BVCP policies <clears throat> that you all are trying to support, I would have added, and I encourage you to think about adding 7.09, which is housing for a full range of households, and 7.16, which is market affordability, market rate housing for missing middle. Um, I, I realize it's not the, the, key, the primary issue you all are focused on, but I really think if it's a, it, we want it to be pointed out that it matters in these discussions, <clears throat> the missing middle stuff. So then my question, which is at no point during the subcommittee meetings, have we really ever talked about the strip malls um, that exist along Arapahoe and <clears throat> elsewhere? that are, um, and I, I'm sure they have a different zones. I don't know what their zones are, but those are areas that over time could become more effectively and efficiently used land um, than you know, a low slung one or two story building with small businesses in it and parking. I don't know, I don't have a, a vision for what those should be, but I'm just sort of curious why we haven't through this process discussed those zones. It's a yeah, question. I think, 
Yeah, no, and I, I probably am not the best one to answer that question because I wasn't in those initial conversations, but I think that that's absolutely, that's why we're bringing this forward now before we jump into module three, is if there's additional things or, or additional topics that we want to bring in or study, um, that's exactly what we want to hear tonight. So um, that's helpful. I don't know if Carl, you have more to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly acknowledge that, that there's a number of areas of the city that are maybe somewhat underutilized or too automoto, automobile oriented and could be made where the buildings are, you know, close to the street, it's more pedestrian friendly, put the parking behind, um, make it a more of a center. Um, I think one of the areas that we're thinking about is, is the area between um, Diagonal Plaza um, down to um, the Boulder Valley Regional Center, that stretch of 28th Street in particular, but I, I think that's on our minds, but it's not really something that we're focusing on with this particular project. It's it's addressed in the Boulder Valley Comfort Zone Plan. It's really an area that I think would probably warrant a, an area planning process to figure out the intensity and how the design should play out on those quarters. So that's why this isn't really necessarily been the focus. It It's actually very similar to the module two, like, you know, Lisa and I are really looking at kind of the areas that are not going to necessarily be rezoned and how to bring those into compliance with the comp plan. And I think with module three, we're kind of looking at those areas of the city, whether residential or BC zones, that we're not anticipating are going to be rezoned. So that's why I would say that that's why those strip mall areas are not included in this. Lisa. Yeah, um, well, first I wanna thank Carl and Lisa for all their work on this. Um, and that makes sense that, you know, if they're not being formally rezoned, then they might not fall under this, but I guess I'll just echo kind of what Sarah said. Um, Cause when I think about kind of a human scale, better use of already developed land, you know, that allows us to kind of get in some of the middle income housing and have what I would consider to be light density, um, those, those, I mean, that, that's what I always think of. I always think, and, and I don't want to, I worry about how those get redeveloped because I'm thinking along 28th, I'm thinking along Arapaho that, you know, there are some longstanding businesses that I think very thoughtfully need to be offered somewhere to exist in the meantime, and then to ensure that they can either own again or lease again and make rent um, and still exist. But um, that's kind of the other side of the loss of industrial is, you know, how, how do we sensibly redevelop some of these areas, not just into condos or apartments or even townhomes, which I'm a huge fan of, um, but, you know, into some kind of, you know, an, an existing restaurant that's not a terribly expensive restaurant, but that has wonderful food, you know, while recognizing that something built in the 1950s through 80s has probably reached the end of its useful life. It's got a parking lot out in front of it. It should never have had a parking lot out in front, you know, if the value is high enough, we need to underground it or tuck it under or push it to the back, put in a nice wide sidewalk, you know, put in a pocket park. You know, how do we get that done on, on a small scale? And and I don't I don't see that kind of redevelopment happening. And it is something that you see in other cities. And so maybe this is the wrong place for it, but I would just love to know what what the planners who have thought about this more than I have, you know, have come up with for ways to encourage that um, and or to discourage, because I know we, we sometimes get a little frustrated by seeing big boxes come up over and over again, even when they're very nice big boxes that they've tried to make as, as nice as possible. Um, you know, and and yeah, I, I just think there's a lot of opportunity there and I hope it gets addressed somehow, even if not through this process. Thanks. ML. Yeah, I would just like to support both um, Sarah and Lisa in um, somewhere, maybe just as a, as a sticky note somewhere, the underused land and what is that currently zoned as and how can um, we at least flag it for what might it be, given that you put this slide in front of us here for the module three focus, which um, I think was going to be focused in the residential areas, but you're starting to, um, I think, bring in a um, an, in, an inclusive and holistic approach to what are the things that need, that go along with residential, um, that would support residential. And I, 
I wonder, as as Lisa and Sarah said, um, what about the underused um, places in Boulder? And we we do have a lot of those uh, kind of strip malls and maybe outdated um, outdated buildings that, given some attention, might. Um, it seems like we're trying to well, not trying to, but the idea of of urbanizing, bringing some urbanization strategies to suburban concepts. I mean, the strip mall is a suburban concept, um, as is acres and acres of single family housing. So I I appreciate that being brought up, and I'm not sure where it fits into your thinking, but um, it would be nice to have it sort of start churning out there. Thanks. Mark? Um, note open here. So um, I, I don't have a lot of input on this in particular. It, it seems early in, in the, sure, focus on, on these, uh, uh, on uh, allowances and standards for, for the uses you've outlined here. What I did want to comment on was uh, I support the goal of having the use tables align with the BBCP and, and, and your inclusion of a number of uh, BBCP goals and uh, objectives uh, was very helpful in the memo. And I think Sarah's uh, recommended additions are also uh, important. Um, but I don't want this to be perceived by, and, and, and I'm, I'm all for public engagement and the kind of robust public engagement that we had in the East Boulder subcommunity plan. However, um, having been involved in a number of different processes, the election commissions, open space uh, commissions and so forth, it is, it is not a time to uh, view public input as an opportunity to relitigate the BVCP. The goals in the BVCP have been adopted uh, and they are there. And I think it's important that the public input be focused around um, does, you know, does changes in the use table that, we're, that are being proposed uh, fulfill and further the BVCP, not um, and not not to let the public think that this is an opportunity to uh, relitigate the BBCP. So I think it's clear that it, it should be very clear that there are guardrails, there are limitations, there are dividing lines that say we're not going to go there. So that's my input on that. Um, in looking also on page twenty one of the of this particular portion of the memo, PDF page 54, you list the boards and commissions that you are um, going to incorporate. And um, I, I, I noticed that tab is missing. And, um, and I, I also look at the downtown, uh, the downtown commission. And I, I think that downtown has established its character. Downtown has uh, it carries way more weight sometimes than I think it should, as seen by our last debate on the West Pearl closure. So I um, uh, I would encourage you to at a minimum include tab and consider <laughs> getting rid of uh, the downtown mall commission in terms of the boards and commissions. So that's my feedback on module three. Thanks. Thanks. Laura. Thank you. First, I wanted to ask, is this is this slide the only slide that we have on module three or is there more? So maybe I'll hold my comments until Lisa gets through all of her slides, but there are lots of things I want to say responding to the excellent comments of my colleagues, but I'll maybe I'll hold them if, if Lisa could go ahead. If that works for you, uh, John. Yeah, that's that's fine. Thanks, Laura. That's and, a good uh, Oh, sorry, I'm, go I'm going to hold my thoughts also until you complete your presentation. 
Okay, great. Uh, I was going to make a joke that you all, you all were going to be disappointed that there's a lot more slides um, to get through. Not a lot, just a couple more. Um, I did just want to highlight some of the engagement that we heard. Um, I mentioned that this has been kind of the hottest topic of the use tables. So um, when we did that engagement initially for phase two back in 2020, it was all virtual because um, it was the summer. Um, we did a Be Heard Boulder questionnaire. We also had some online public information sessions for people, but I just wanted to give an overview, very high level of the feedback that we heard at that time. Um, which was focused on this topic. Um, majority of respondents were open to a greater mix of uses in neighborhood centers. So uses like restaurants, coffee shops, retail, personal service, a uh, greater mix of housing. Um, we asked people what was most important and they said walking and biking access and human scale design. Um, we had a similar question asking um, if people were open to a greater mix of uses within a 15 minute walk of their house or where they work, um, and a majority of respondents were open to that as well, a similar mix of uses, um, but their uh, housing may be at a lower intensity for that than a, in a neighborhood center. And then we also have that detailed input that I've already mentioned from the uh, planning board subcommittee meetings, as well as the public that attended those and gave some comments there. Um, and then I was going to just mention the council feedback that we've gotten so far, um, kind of on the left side is what we got in 2020, right side is the additional input that we got for our for these questions, um, support for allowing a greater diversity of uses in neighborhood centers, really focusing on this is what we've heard already focusing on those neighborhood serving uses and uses that would encourage walkability. Um, and then support for allowing limited circumstances of walkable and compatible uses in order to foster those 15 minute neighborhoods in those homogenous areas. Um, but council did at that point um, say that there should be a review process that allows opportunities for neighborhood input and potentially planning board review in that kind of uh, situation. There was also support for more flexibility for creative uses. So art artist type uses, um, theater performance type um, businesses. Um, and then just a real emphasis on the outreach to neighborhoods for feedback on the potential changes. What we heard a couple weeks ago in our study session with council, some questions about um, what were what could be some incentives that we could incorporate that would encourage neighbors to accept these new uses in their areas or um, be more on board with this type of new use. Um, council members also encouraged innovation, um, thinking innovatively about which uses could be allowed to develop a rich mix of uses near housing, um, noting that it's more sustainable for people to be able to walk to the uses that they might need. Uh, council members also noted that potentially thinking about how these uses align with our locations of schools might be a good framing reference um, using the schools in our community. Um, as identifying uh, landmarks or features for these uses to be located around. Um, and then some council members were excited about the potential opportunity with this section to address concerns of housing costs and climate change, um, providing a broad range of options, and then uh, wanted us to provide a broad range of options um, while noting that there um, has to be kind of a mix of approaches rather than just adding uses in commercial hubs, you would also need to have the kind of housing to support those types of uses. So thinking about it from many different angles. So that is what we've heard from council in terms of direction. As I mentioned, this is really just general direction. We've kind of already gotten into the conversation, but um, just hoping to see if there's any other specific direction that you all have related to neighborhood serving uses that we can start thinking about for module three. Well, thank you. Looking to my colleagues here, Laura. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. First, I want to say that I am strongly supportive of staff's direction in general. Like the list that you had on your first slide, I think is a really good one. I think you're asking all the right questions. And, um, you know, I am sensitive to Sarah's concern, and it sounds like the council has had the same concern that not all neighbors in uh, typically low density residential neighborhoods are going to love the concept of mixed use. I think it's going to be a, a conversation that will require some courage and some vision. I uh, strongly related to Mark's comments about the BBCP and pulling forward those policies, and this is not an opportunity to relitigate that. We do have goals as a city to have more mixed uses and more 15 minute neighborhoods. 
Um, and uh, I think Sarah added some really good policies to that. I want to comment in particular on missing middle. This is where I'm going to come out really strong and say that this is our one of our golden opportunities to get more missing middle housing in Boulder. Um, I think probably everybody here is familiar with Daniel Parolik's book on missing middle housing. Um, I read it when I first came on planning board. And one of the key concepts in that book is that typically low density residential neighborhoods are one of the key places where missing middle housing can make sense, especially if you are um, have regulations that say that the type of housing that you're looking for is within the envelope of what would be allowed for a large single family house, right? Currently in my neighborhood, small houses are being torn down and being replaced with very large luxury homes. And I don't begrudge those neighbors, they're beautiful homes. They're absolutely gorgeous. And I know a lot of my neighbors are very happy about the impact on property values. But you could also, instead of building one large luxury home, build four condos, build a, a triplex, right? And those are still not gonna be market rate affordable for low income folks, but they will provide a diversity of housing types and options that we do not currently have much of in Boulder. So I am strongly in favor of thinking about how to gently, carefully, not in a blanket way, but think about where it makes sense to build more missing middle housing or allow that um, in low density or traditionally low density neighborhoods, whether that's around transit corridors or other amenities. Um, I do want to point out that uh, transit corridors are changing. Uh, folks may have seen the e-bike tours that are coming through Boulder and you know neighborhoods that might be near trailheads or might be near nice bike paths are now becoming transit corridors for e-bikes and e-bike tours and so i can totally see having like a nice cafe like a lucille's um on the edge of uh open space you know in a residential neighborhood where tours are coming through people are parking at the trailhead and they would love to have an opportunity to buy their kids an ice cream or sit down and have a nice brunch and combine that with a hike on the open space so i think we can think really creatively about where these uses make sense given the changing patterns of how people are using space especially now with the additional accessibility provided by motorized options like scooters if we extend that program west of 28th street and e-bikes um, and uh, i also really appreciate sarah's comments about neighborhood centers i think that's going to be an easy win-win i think she's right that that's a place where there's a lot of consensus so i think um, that is one thing one of many things that i'm hoping come out of this is the diversification of how we use the land in those neighborhood centers and build in mixed use there and i also really appreciated council's addition of, of framing this in terms of uh climate change and um you know boulder as a city needs to be less car dependent um, and have more of our needs met in our neighborhoods. And I think that this module is really gonna help with that. And so I applaud and appreciate the work that staff is doing here. I know it's not gonna be easy. I know we are gonna have a diversity of opinions and I think we really need to think as a community, how, how do we have some vision and how we implement our BBCP policies. Thanks. Okay, other thoughts? Well, I, I just have a couple comments. I, I appreciate Sarah's and, and Laura's uh, thoughts. Um, I not I have not been a member of the subcommittee dealing with this uh, effort, but I have been paying close attention to it on from planning board for for a long time. And I have to say that I think that the while the objectives that have been laid out here are are good and reasonable i share the concern for the focus on 15 minute neighborhoods and the string of pearls concepts without clearer understanding and definition of them and with for example with the respect to the 15 minute neighborhoods i think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what what is actually likely to be included in a 15-minute neighborhood it's very unlikely that each 15-minute neighborhood is going to have a, a safeways or a king supers in it you know they don't like to build 
uh, their grocery stores for such small areas and uh, service groups. So the same is true for McGuckins, and the same is true for uh, many of the other businesses that a lot of people think are likely to be included in them. It may be that there's room for a, an ice cream store and a nice restaurant in, in such a, uh, so, so scattered around town, but without some better definition of what that actually means, I think that there's going to be a lot of misunderstanding and, uh, and unsatisfactory outcomes. So I, I think some attention needs to be paid to that. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to go off a little bit of what you just said, John, and just say that one of the things that currently really frustrates me about our code as it exists and that I think kind of prevents some of these 15 minute neighborhoods is that you can't put in like a small breakfast lunch joint that also has a cooler case that sells probably more expensive than in the grocery store, milk and butter and eggs and whatever. Um, I lived in Portland um, while I was in college and granted a lot of Portland was developed pre-war and has a lot of streetcar suburbs that we don't have. Um, but you had little places like that, you know, somewhere you could walk, you could, you know, throughout the city where you could walk and you could get a sandwich. It wasn't even a full convenience store or anything, but it had just odds and ends of stuff that you needed. So if you needed to buy, you know, a thing of sugar, they had one brand, like I said, it was probably marked up a bit, but you could walk, you know, and, um, and right now that's, we can't build those, you know, they're, they're literally restricted out by the code. And, and so I, th I think the point about, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily want to put in place something that, um, is going to read to big national developers like, oh, great, I can put a King Supers on this corner because that's not there and then the demand isn't there. Um, it just makes me sad that, you know, somewhere can't have, and even have, you know, a beer or a wine license, you know, maybe not hard liquor and then they close at 10 or something or 9, 30, I don't know. Um, you know, but that's just something like that, that I think the neighborhood pub basically that also has a cooler out front, we just don't have them um, and they're not allowed. So anyway, that's a very specific example, but I, I think that's what builds a neighborhood is having somewhere you can walk to like that. But if we're gonna allow uses like that, we have to be very, very particular about what kind of scale and intensity and hours and whatever, you know, that that would actually involve. Um, and specifically I'm speaking in my neighborhood, but when we had a, a really wonderful in many ways um, pitch for the corner of Greenbrier and Broadway for affordable housing, one of the things that made me crazy is that that's a very high trafficked location. It's a major entrance into the city and there was nothing public and nothing neighborhoody about it. So um, yeah, it, however we can figure out how to weave that in um, at an appropriate community scale, that's something I personally would love to see be possible in the city. Thank you. Sarah. Thanks. So <laughs> um, I, I agree with uh, John, and I think what Lisa was saying that we really need a definition of 15 minute neighborhood. Um, if that's going to be something that we pursue. Um, <clears throat> I happen to feel very strongly that some of this is sequencing. And I, I know that we try to do things holistically, but part of, part of my thinking is I, I wish I would prefer that we focus uh, this is just a preference of mine. I would prefer that we focus on the neighborhood centers because that is, uh, to, Lee's, to Laura's point, I think there's a lot of agreement that those areas could be much more productive in terms of housing and work and different kinds of retail and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's going to take a while for to, to get that um, dialed in exactly correctly. And it's something that won't be controversial, <laughs> whereas upzoning residential areas is by definition going to be controversial. And the very fact that, you know, some folks on city council said, well, what can you at planning department do to make people more amenable <laughs> to upzoning? Like, that's not really your job. And it's not really council's job. I mean, it's uh, so my my preference would be that we focus on things we can actually get done 
with a minimal minimum amount of friction. And I think that the neighborhood centers are a good example of that. And if we can get through that, I mean, the the amount of housing that is likely to be unleashed by East Boulder subcommunity plan, by neighborhood centers, by whatever we end up doing on you know phase two of of um, TVAP, there's going to be a lot of housing coming online, uh, assuming that people still want to build housing. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of housing coming online, and that's a good thing. But I think the it, it's valuable to try to avoid until absolutely necessary, the most conflictual kind of policy conversations. Because um, we can get stuff done and then then try to address the harder stuff. So I, I realize that the project is defined as it's defined, but I would really urge us to focus on the things we, can, we know we can get done. Thank you. Lisa. It's a wrong hand, it's still up, sorry. Okay, any more thoughts? Okay, Lisa, Lisa Hood, <laughs> carry All right. on. All right, I think I only have one more slide for you just to follow up. Um, thanks for the great discussion on all of these topics. Um, this is really helpful feedback. Um, the next step is really to start to are related to module two, um, not module three, but start to draft these changes. We're meeting with our liaisons, ML and Sarah. So we'll dig into more of what we talked about um, in, I think, is that next week or week afterwards, um, early October. We're also convening another meeting of the working group in early October. Um, we're tentatively scheduled for the October 18th uh, planning board meeting to bring a draft ordinance before you. Um, that's where we would have a public hearing, um, but we'll be discussing that based on um, the conversation today. And um, there would be continued public outreach throughout that time. We are currently um, tentatively scheduled for city council in December. So there's a bit of wiggle room there between October and November. Um, and more time there. And then the second reading would be mid-December. And that's trying to keep us on schedule with the same momentum through this project um, to get to that module three. So that's what you can expect um, coming up soon. And um, again, just wanna thank you for all the time spent on this project and thoughtful feedback. Well, thank you. That was a very useful and interesting presentation and discussion, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of our formal agenda. There might be some matters from staff other than this that uh, do you have any you want to raise? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, giving such a warm acknowledgement to Lane's service and uh, the importance of public service. I try to emphasize that uh, to staff on a regular basis, including an all staff meeting that we had today. And um, I don't think it's uh, news to anybody that uh, those of us in the public sector are not um, always uh, approached with the, the, the best of uh, assumptions. Uh, in fact, I've read a survey that suggested that uh, societies um, respect for various institutions throughout society has declined, uh, which is a much bigger discussion, of course, we can have, but government was right in there. So we, we do our best to um, break those stereotypes that people may bring forward. And I, I just appreciate the um, uh, heart that our, our staff have for public service. And, and Elaine is just a perfect example of that. So thank you for recognizing that and, and sharing that with her. Um, you all, I believe, are aware of, uh, not to steal Amanda's thunder, maybe she was going to speak about the October 3rd retreat. In fact, is there anything more you want to mention on that? Amanda, I, sh I should have let you bring that up. No, no worries. Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody about the retreat on October 3rd and to um, keep your eyes on your email this next week as we prepare for that and an agenda is forthcoming. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to um, 
share with you that we, we appreciate both your roles in legislative matters as well as the um, um, the uh, quasi-judicial items that you often get. And we fully appreciate that um, there seems to be an infinite um, need for uh, comprehensive planning processes. Uh, we certainly have identified uh, many of those. Uh, many of those are identified in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and other plans. Um, Sub-community plans, uh, corridor plans, uh, transit plans, and in fact, uh, one staff member um, on, on staff is, is responsible for really tracking all of the different uh, master plan efforts that are taking place throughout the city on a regular basis, which at last count was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 12 or 13. So Chris uh, Anglos in our comprehensive planning division is tasked with that. So we recognize the importance of that and, and we appreciate your engagement and all those things. I will share with you that uh, a couple items that have been identified for the more immediate term, such as ADUs and uh, occupancy limits, uh, changes associated with affordable housing, and then the ones that you've been working with uh, more recently, the site plan, uh, changes in the use tables like we discussed uh, tonight. But those are all items that um, we will be highlighting for council on Thursday uh, very briefly along with a, a broader uh, overview of TVAP uh, and um, just a preview of that. We certainly haven't gotten into engagement, just a preview of the potential process. And then tentatively on November 10th, uh, we're going to have a more extended conversation with council too about um, all those various work program items and then a little bit of guidance from them on how to prioritize them uh, in light of our current resources and staffing. Um, I will say too along those lines we've been very appreciative of both the city manager office uh, manager's office as well as council um, preliminarily in their discussions about the budget and their support for uh, what was a big ask this year of our department uh, for multiple positions. And it looks like um, all signs are aligning that we would get eight new positions, which will help uh, with some of the uh, losses we had due to uh, cutbacks during COVID, but also to, to try to uh, build some bench depth and also um, bring us to a place where we can, uh, I was gonna say juggle multiple projects, but we, of course, are already doing that, but to maybe add to that over time as well and, and recognize just the uh, robust planning processes that uh, citizens and you all engage in and which we certainly support and, and want to keep uh, very alive in the city of Boulder as well. So I've probably done enough talking. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you. Any questions for Brad? Laura? You're muted, Laura. Sorry, double muted uh, on my headset. Um, first, uh, congratulations on the uh, what we think is going to be good news about the eight new positions. That's fantastic news. Uh, super excited to hear that. Well deserved and looking forward to all the great things the department will do with all that staffing. Um, I did want to ask, you know, you said you're going to talk with City Council about priorities. I wanted to ask where the Boulder Airport Master Plan falls into that, because I know that that is a work plan item that you folks are uh, wanting to do in the near future, um, sort of accelerate that. And uh, I, I made a request that that process be really robust with a lot of outreach, which may have implications for budget and prioritization. So is that an item that you'll be discussing with City Council? Um, Laura, at this time, it was not flagged for that. Of course, um, all items will be on the table for them to, to raise. Um, Charles, I might see if you've got any insights into whether we had that on any timeline yet at this point. Um, I don't believe we do. As I recall, the last update was in 2007, um, and I don't know that it has been calendared here for 23. I, oh, be I, wrong. I might be wrong. I thought that uh, it was being pushed forward to start the master planning process this coming year. Could be wrong. Let me look. I, I do know, Laura, that as part of the East uh, Boulder subcommunity plan, 
uh, you know, those comments were flagged and, and um, some awareness around that. But uh, I did not recall that being on next year's work program, but we can we can double check on that. Well, and again, actually, part of part of the conversation is about how do we manage um, kind of a lot of different priorities that are that are coming forward from a, a number of sources. I, I'm sorry, John. Yeah, actually, the airport was uh, within the boundaries of the uh, East Boulder subcommunity plan, but in fact, it did not get addressed in the plan itself. And so I think uh, Laura's quite right. We folk, we uh, focused on that and, and recommended that it move ahead sooner rather than later. I think it yeah, was in this. It was in the CIP package, some money for the airport to do master planning. Um, and I thought that that was beginning in 2023. I'd have to go back and look at that that packet. But we, as a planning board, approved a recommendation to council that that um, master planning process include a very robust public outreach component equivalent to doing, is it called a SEEP? Like SEEP might not be the right process, but we said equivalent kind of investment and effort as a SEEP. That was our recommendation to council. So I was just wanting to see how that gets carried forward in their budget prioritization. Because right. I think it was flagged for us that council may disagree that that needs that level of attention. Right. I, I, I have a better understanding now of kind of the discussion around this. So um, yes, I didn't mean to, first of all, didn't mean to imply that it was in the East Boulder plan that, that is correct. I understand it's not, but certainly the discussion in the minutes and, and around that um, had made its way forward to council. And I misunderstood kind of a, a department sponsored master plan for the airport. Uh, that is not on the timeline, but in terms of the airport itself doing an update, that's scheduled for 2023. You are, you are correct about that. So I, I misunderstood the context. Um, we will make sure i although i'm confident that message already has been passed on to them but yes we will make sure that as it evolves and, and moves forward that they are reminded of, of the discussion that took place leading up to that so sorry i didn't key right into that uh, a couple other ones that are not sponsored directly by the department here but are citywide or wastewater update uh, in 23 24 transportation master plan update in 24 and the library, um, although I suspect that depends kind of on the vote here coming up, but the library master plan in 2024. Um, so, so that's just a, a sampling of kind of the, the list of things um, that are outside of the department that also include a master plan. Mark. Um. Yeah, I just all this discussion about the airport and the East Boulder subcommunity plan, and this may be, I may embarrass myself here, but what is the status of the final reconciliation and final adoption of the East Boulder subcommunity plan as amended by planning board at our last meeting? Or not, not the last meeting, but the last time it came before us, right. we had one final amendment that my understanding was it goes back to council now and we all hope that they agree <laughs> so um that is scheduled to go to council on october let me know six it's there. october six and that will be um under the consent agenda on the sixth for introduction and then um looking through here quickly Sorry, I'm not finding immediately when that is coming up for final on that. Um, well, uh, Amanda, do you do you happen to know when second is for that? I'm not finding that immediately. I have it right here. Let's see. <coughs> And now my computer has chosen to lock up. Bear with me. <laughs> Second reading and public hearing of adoption of the East Boulder subcommunity plan. Yeah, council on October 6th. So second reading on the 6th, consent on uh, the first, the first reading was. 
I think they already had it. I think it's yeah, considered it's, that they uh, already had it. That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's correct. So, and, and and just to be clear, uh, the first the the first reading on the consent agenda was post planning board's last revision. That's correct. Okay. I, what was it? I thought I thought that it hasn't been back to council since we. Uh, they made an amendment about that section that's up by Western Avenue, and then we had a meeting where we said yeah, we disagreed you know with what? that. And I don't think it's been back to them since then. No, Laura, you're right. They're going to they're going to entertain that on second reading. You're right. Yeah, and I would encourage you to take a look at the package um, that outlines the communication of planning boards uh, relating of those matters. Um, I do have a fairly strong confidence that they will uh, come to closure on this matter. Uh, we, 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 I know that they are conscientious of the pitfalls of doing kind of the ping pong uh, for these types of plans that require full approval from both the, the planning board and the council. Um, so I, I suspect there'll be sensitivity towards that and recognition of the planning board's comments. Uh, but those will be reflected specifically in the in the body of the staff report. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Any matters from the board? All right. You've got uh, October the third on your calendar. I hope. Thank you, Amanda, for sorting that out. Sure, you're welcome. Okay. That being the case, I think it's time to adjourn. So let's let's go to home and go to sleep. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.